to begin with. Uh, is there a motion to establish the agenda? I move we establish the agenda as published. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, Superintendent, would you like to um, make some recognitions? Certainly. Um, as you may know, a Lake Ridge third grade student passed away this week after a very courageous battle with leukemia. Many of you followed his journey and supported his family over the past couple of years, including the K-Kids Drive referenced in tonight's fundamental report that raised funds for cancer research in his honor. So let us please observe a moment of silence in his memory and in honor of his family as well. Thank you. We have some recognitions this evening as well. First up, um, as you will note on our personnel report, we have our um, assistant principal, elementary assistant principal recommendation for the board. So with us this evening with her family is Melanie Reedy. And Melanie has been appointed as associate principal at Northwood and West Mercer. This will be effective July 1, and of course um, is on the personnel report tonight. Northwood principal Amy Batliner Gillette and West Mercer principal Carol Bess said Melanie will be a great addition to the leadership team at both of those schools. She comes to Mercer Island from the Kent School District where she served as an instructional coach and mentor specialist for teachers. She also spent 10 years in the classroom as an elementary school teacher. Melanie received her Bachelor's of Arts in Education and English from the University of Northern Colorado, her Master's in Education from the University of Washington, and is completing her principal certification in the Danforth program at the University of Washington, and I know she's counting the days because when we talked it was June. So Melanie is here to, um, with her family and she's going to introduce them to us now. We might need to ask them to stand so we can see them way back okay. there. Members of the board, thank you for, for having me here this evening. Um, I'm super excited about this opportunity. I've um, been in education for 18 years and I feel like my journey has landed me here for, for a reason and I feel like it's a great fit. Um, I'm excited to be a part of the, the personalized learning and, um, and part of all of the great work around, around building kind learners. Um, so thank you very much. I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity. So I have my husband here, Jason. And then I have three kiddos, so Kira is my oldest, and then Jackson is my middle, and then Cameron. So they are, we're all thrilled to be part of your community um, and, and for this opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the Mercer Island family, Melanie. Next to recognize is five Mercer Island School District teachers who have recently achieved National Board certification from the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. There are now 48 National Board certified teachers in the district. Um, I would like the teachers to um, stand as we say their name and then we will have them come forward. So, Jaina Dash from Islander Middle School. <laughs> who has received her, uh, her board certification in school counseling, early childhood and young adult. Brian Hamsch from Mercer Island High School. And Brian has received his certification in science, adolescence and young adult. Uh, Drury Klein from Islander Middle School. Also school counseling, early childhood to young adult. Carissa Murphy. <laughs> Carissa is at Lake Ridge Elementary and has received her National Board Certification in Music, Early and Middle Childhood. And from Northwood Elementary, Nina Nierman. <laughs> and Nina has received her National Boards in, um, she's our, actually our PLP teacher, but has received her Board Certification as a Generalist in Early Childhood. 
and, is Pe and Peggy is here as well. Peggy Aguilar, um, our Spanish teacher at MIHS, who's helped with the new National Board Certified Teachers. So thank you, Peggy, in helping them to all achieve this. So these teachers join a growing com community of board certified teachers now, more than 118,000 strong across all 50 states. And this year's new board certified teachers are the first certified under the redesigned assessment, developed to be more flexible and accessible for teachers. Um, the certification consists of four components, an assessment of the content knowledge, a portfolio showing student of work students have done and the teachers feedback to the student, two videos of the teachers in the classroom, so they still have the videos in there, <laughs> um, showing lessons taught and the interaction with and among students, a portfolio of reflective work, what the teacher does outside the classroom that translates into the classroom, and the last three components are assessed by a national panel of peers. Numbers released by the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards show that Washington has the most new National Board certified teachers of any state with 1,434 and the total number of 10,135 National Board certified teachers in Washington is third in the country o overall. So welcome to an elite pool of National Board certified teachers. Congratulations to each of you. And we would love to have you come up here and stand behind the board, all five of you, and Peggy, if you could join them as well. I'd be remiss in not doing a photo op for our communications department, so come on up, please. <laughs> So proceeding with the uh, agenda tonight, we are going to, we're moving to section two, full governance process monitoring. Uh, subject A, board policy 2020, fundamental five, 21st century thinking skills. Um, Donna, would you like to take it from here? Actually, I am going to turn it over to Fred and team who are going to make their way to the tables for the presentation for fundamental five, 21st century thinking skills. We'll start with Fundamental 5, and um, we have Island Park and West Mercer here with us uh, right now. Um, Mercer High School is either going to join us part of this one or into Fundamental 6, so they'll be here um, as well. So I'll start with Fundamental 5 this evening, and Jennifer then will go with Fundamental 6 afterwards, so we'll run through it all. As a reminder to the everyone following along at home or um, to in the public, our fifth Fundamental Cultivate and foster thinking and process skills such as analytical and critical thinking, cross-discipline thinking, creativity, innovation, leadership, collaboration, communication, problem solving, and information and technology literacy in curriculum design. The one addition that the board made a year ago was leadership. That was not part of this fundamental, which has since been added um, in, and we have some of uh, new ways to uh, monitor uh, the use of uh, or implementation of leadership in our students. 
So this is the fifth full report on Fundamental 5, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of items um, really with respect to the quantitative indicators. Um, first, to capture leadership, two of the educational effectiveness survey questions were added to this year's survey. Um, students are involved in decisions about things that affect them in the school, and in class we often work with other students to solve a problem. So in tonight's uh, report, you can see that's been broken out by our elementary students and then our secondary students. Um, something else that's important to point out, and this is a global change for the educational effectiveness survey um, as a whole. So all of our reports from this point going forward that use the educational effectiveness survey, we need to be aware of the change that they made. In your packet tonight, um, board members, there is a dark line separating 1617 and 1718, and we'll put that into future board reports as well, just as a reminder for all of us that there's a change in the metric. And as I put in uh, to the board report tonight, it really will have a change, particularly for responses that have it traditionally or historically had many people who just chose not to answer or had the NA and um, not applicable. Um, as I wrote in the board report to you, um, there's a significant change in the way that they're now calculating that, such that they're now they're no longer counting those against the total N, so that changes some of the scores. If I can go ahead and just point you to page three of the Fundamental Five report, um, one example of this that I'm still working through with the center, my hypothesis for why we have such a discrepancy between historical trends around the question posed to staff um, students are provided tasks that require higher level thinking skills. You can see that the trend go, spikes way up um, for this current year. When I look at the total responses for this question across all of the schools, this is one that receives quite a number of non, no responses, and I think that's because it's staff, not teachers. And there, I think we have many classified staff who per, per, perhaps choose not to answer this question, um, feeling that maybe they don't have that expertise. If that's the case, that could be attributing um, to this large bump. I am in conversation with Greg Lubdell from the center as we speak. Um, if I get further information, I'll let you know, but the asterisk there designates that I'm still trying to uncover that exact data point. We just received the data for, for this year's um, report last Thursday, so I scrambled to put this together for your packet. So that's, that's the piece there. Any questions on that change from the center? Just, um, and it may have been in here. Are they tracking something, uh, an additional indicator to get that calculation, or is there, they're just um, processing it differently? And if they're processing it differently, could we ask them to go back and normalize the data so that we don't have to have that solid line? Is that a possibility? It is a potential and a possibility. It will change other reports that we would get from them as well, so that might be a conversation for um, a future board conversation that you have. We're intrigued by the data that they're gonna be giving to us because it will help us to better see what's going on, but it does change the historical nature of it. Um, if that's something you wanna talk about as a board and then give us direction, we can work with the center um, in a number of different ways. So I'll leave that up to you all, yeah. So moving forward, um, in other areas of the report, um, from a quantitative standpoint, for the areas that didn't see the large spike, um, I think we have good news and bad news. The good news is our trend data seems to be fairly consistent over time, and it seems to be fairly um, high in many categories. Um, the bad news is we're not seeing a lot of variation um, in the positive direction. Historical trends over time um, tend to hover um, within, you know, eight to 10 percentage points of one another over time, and we're looking, of course, at a five-year trend. So um, I think that's something for us to consider um, as we think about, well, are we, you know, focus, what, what is the real focus and how do we move that needle um, uh, as we move forward? The other pieces, of course, we don't have the historical data on this report for the leadership pieces. That's a new ad this year. Um, it is interesting when you look at the students when they're reporting that they feel involved in decisions at the school level. Um, 
uh, it, it might be reflective of some of our voters on how they feel about involvement in government in general, but um, it would still be worth our attention to see how do we continue to involve students in decision making. I know you have on your board uh, agenda tonight one way that you're trying to work with that and, and involve the student voice um, right here at the board table. So I know our schools are still interested in that. They find different ways. Um, maybe it would never be that every student feels like they're completely involved, but how do we move that needle a little bit? So um, now uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that with the, with the quantitative piece, take any other questions with respect to the data that you're seeing, and then turn it over to the school teams. There seemed to be a drop, you know, where we could ask the question of third to fifth graders and then of secondary students. Uh, there did seem to be a drop between those two. Is that just cynicism as we age? I, I <laughs> <laughs> we see that all the way across the board. Yeah. And when you look at um, even the, the top 8% of um, schools that the center kind of categorizes of which we fall into as kind of a league of schools, um, they see it as well. I mean, that is a pretty traditional path where our, our elementary students are most optimistic and then middle school followed by our high schoolers. We did add third grade this year as well to the report. I think that's worth noting. We had traditionally just done fourth and fifth grade, but because we were doing the high cap review with this, we needed their voice. So third graders were included for the first time in the EES survey this year um, as well. And we have to consider whether or not we want to continue um, with that or, or not in future years. So you know we can continue to discuss that as well. Thank you. You're welcome. There was one thing I um, noticed and that caught my eye. And, and again, there is that disparity between um, the third and fifth grade and then as you get into the secondary students. Um, but the one that I kind of found sad was the question on, uh, let's see, which page is it? Page three, um, I'm a creative person. So uh, we've got 91% of our our third to fifth graders who feel that they are creative people, and yet when we get into secondary students, that drops to 77%. And so, I don't know. I was like, what, what happens there? Right. Where did the creativity go? Um, and, and how are they thinking about creativity? Right. Um, do they start to see themselves as less creative because we start to box in what is creative versus not? And, exactly. and so what are, the, what are the signals that we're sending to them either systemically in schools or, or even larger in, in our society? So it's a great, um, th that's a good one to possibly put an asterisk by to think about. Thank yeah. you. Well, I know that um, some studies have indicated that when being creative, whether it's just doodling, uh, drawing, uh, writing poetry, that you're tapping into that empathetic portion of the brain. Yeah. And so just that simple practice of doodling or creating something every day helps to create more empathetic people. Um, and so that's one of the things that caught my eye there is right. how can we keep kids, students, feeling like they're creative people. And because it drives me crazy when I hear people say, oh, I can't draw. I'm not an artistic person. I'm not a creative person. And um, I thought you know, we're all creative people, and it's important. So yeah. You bet. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I'll just um, make a statement and it might be better for our next meeting when we're going over indicators and con considering different indicators, but I'll th throw it out for you as well, uh, that we tend to sometimes add indicators and I think w w if we're gonna have that discussion, we always continue to have that discussion then maybe we should invite ourselves to also take away indicators so that these reports just don't become so large. And I mention it now as opposed to our next meeting since you're here and maybe there's an opportunity to invite you during these reports uh, to say, if you're thinking about taking <laughs> away an indicator, here's <laughs> our thought for various reasons. So I'll let you go. You're ready for that? No, I'm just <laughs> <kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> Let me turn it over to the school teams uh, who each kind of thought about one that they wanted to highlight tonight and then we'll open it up on the qualitative as well. So who would like to start? Great. Good evening. So um, the one that I um, wanted to highlight is um, under the creativity and innovation and um, it's the elementary science center. Um, as you know, for a number of years, uh, fifth graders have participated in the Mu Museum of Flight uh, field trip. 
And the fifth grade team at West Mercer was the early adopters for this new science curriculum. And that gave them an opportunity to look around and say, is there another um, field trip that would, um, would be even better than the Museum of Flight? So um, they found uh, this experience at the Science Center, and it was very rich, engaging, and uh, really seemed to fit the bill. So there was three different experiences that students participated in, and one was completely um, engineering focused. So you know, with a real lens for STEM, it was you know a maker space where they're presented with a problem and some materials, and they needed to work together in a team to uh, to create a solution for that. Um, students loved it and were um, very creatively engaged um, in a deep problem-solving um, experience. And then they um, had two other experiences where, again, it was based on the Common Core, the, sorry, the NGSS standards, the Next Generation Science Standards that were um, about um, our solar system and um, life on another planet. And it just, it was so exciting that we could find another experience that fit our new science curriculum that could po possibly replace the Museum of Flight if that you know decided to go forward. So I just wanted to highlight that as a real success for our new science curriculum. Sure. Mine's kind of related. Good evening, everyone. So we've been, uh, over the years, we've been doing this activity, and it just fits in perfectly with theme one, which is analytical and critical thinking, cross-discipline thinking and problem solving. Um, over the years, our students have studied the mathematical artwork of M.C. Escher. Um, there's a lot of uh, math involved with a lot of art and dealing with perspective. But they've also invited Ellen Hockbert, who's a local artist who does, I think the li at West Mercer runs an art camp every year to come in for a few weeks. She works with the fifth graders on a unit she calls Leonardo da Vinci Artist Scientist in Residence Project. And it's through an um, MISF grant, and she comes dressed as someone from 17th century, I believe. Is that Leonardo's time, 17th century? And they spend a couple weeks just studying nature and um, writing in journals and observing, which was a big thing with Leonardo, um, and then conducting some experiments. And the project culminates in, in teams. They design flying machines, similar to those that um, Leonardo would have sketched and put together out of balsa wood and tissue paper. And they study ratios and they look at the human body and the ratios of the, the length of the body and the arms and then the relationship of bird wings and the bird bodies. And they are just amazing, their creativity and the different flying machines that end up um, hanging from the ceiling. But again, the part of the beauty of this project is the collaborative piece where they're working in teams, um, conducting experiments, trying out different uh, models, and then finally putting something together. So um, we look forward to continuing to do that if it fits in with science. <laughs> if. <laughs> So I'm going to talk briefly about our new leadership opportunity that we have for students at Island Park. Um, we have two opportunities for students. Um, it has to do also in the area of communication and problem solving, but it's in the area of social emotional learning. Um, and so we have a peer mentor program that's happening with our PLP program. Um, we really were finding that students uh, with our uh, more significant disabilities out at recess were primarily engaging with adults and we wanted to um, kind of foster a way for them to have more um, positive interactions with their peers. Um, and so our PLP teacher, as well as um, our YSF counselor, myself, we got together and we said, how can we do this? And so we started a peer mentor program, thinking that we might have a few students throughout the week um, to be out at recess, engaging with the students and helping them connect with other students. Um, we had over 45 students sign up for the um, opportunity. And um, so we had to narrow it down to 28 
We're working primarily with our fifth graders um, and we're getting ready, we're gearing up with our current fourth graders and then um, preparing them for next year and just thinking about how we can expand that. So now, um, I mean, our POP program has always been very central to Island Park, um, but I really feel that this is just an opportunity again that has really flourished. Um, and highlights the empathetic, you know, the empathetic nature and compassionate nature of our students, um, and gives them an opportunity to uh, grow that. Uh, and it's just part of our school culture. So we're really excited about that, and the kids are really excited about that. Um, the other piece that we've done is we have a recess mentor program, and that was new this year. Um, it came out of again social emotional needs for um, particularly our incoming kindergartners, um, and so. Just learning how to do some problem solving um, with kids, communicating, I need some space and so forth as, a, um, as opposed to uh, becoming physical and just that impulse control that many very younger students have. So, um, and, and then we were just noticing other things also. Our data was telling us after recess that we could use some a additional support out there. Kids were very interested in it. Um, again, we have well over 30 students who have signed up primarily um, fourth and fifth graders, uh, and they go out um, with their badges and they have their yellow jackets mm -hmm. and um, just going around, it's been really interesting. They really haven't approached other kids and said, hello, my name is. So that was an interesting, um, we taught them how to do that instead of just kind of going up and jumping right in to solve a problem. Um, so it's been really great. We've had great feedback as far as hearing student voices. Our students are telling us that they love it, but they wanted to have more opportunity with younger students. Um, it's difficult when you're a fifth grader and you're doing problem solving with a fourth grader or with a fellow fifth grader. So David and I put together a schedule for next year where they will have opportunities where we have fifth graders with um, first and third graders and we have fourth graders with second and kindergartners. Um, so they'll have opportunities to do that. And we're t doing this through our second step curriculum and teaching them uh, the problem solving strategies and how um, to help kids get calm. So um, it really kind of infuses many of um, the, our Fundamental Five uh, into those two programs and we're really looking forward to growing them um, as we move forward into next year. Good afternoon. I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of the yoga project. Um, and this is something we've been working on in integrating diversity and equity all through the curriculum. And so our PE teachers decided to take the yoga that they've been doing. And by the way, that's a very popular PE course at uh, Prince Rodin's High School. We started it about four years ago. And what they did is on the research project, they um, were each student had to do a report out to their peers about the history of yoga in different aspects of it. And then today I was actually in one of the classes and was t uh, had a chance to watch uh, the, the class and two of the students were leading the class in some of the work that they've been studying. And that's that whole uh, teacher, teacher leadership of also developing the skills of our students to take in charge of their lesson, and um, so it was a very interesting lesson to watch the students leading, and they actually were very disciplined with each other, I think more so than the, they are with the teacher. <laughs> so uh, it was nice to be able to see them leading that and integrating in the history of yoga and also looking at um, the, where it comes from and why it was all uh, founded. So thank you for... Questions from the board for our teams. So in the high school, I really liked, I think we had discussed the science uh, Olympiad before and we were wondering, do our kids ever participate in any uh, science fairs? And I see we've done really well in science fairs and I, I love that addition. Would you, do you want to just comment on that? So the first, this is the first year. Uh, we had a science club and uh, we wanted to change the focus of that club. And part of the challenge you have is it's supposed to be student led on the clubs. They're ASB clubs and part of the, the rules, if you will, under ASB is that these are student led clubs. And uh, so it was taking the students from wanting to go out and set off rockets in a field to um, yes, as people are going, 
um, <laughs> to moving towards, let's look at um, a, a curriculum that would really be an exciting, challenging curriculum for you to challenge yourselves with and furthering your more exploration in the area of science. So the, the teacher who took over the club uh, went through a transition stage last year. She and I met several times about where we wanted to go with the club and how to help the students get there. And she did a really great job of transitioning that, that group. And so this year was our first year competing and you saw some of the results. Um, and you know, for a first year, mm -hmm. the students mm -hmm. learning, they're doing all this after school hours. Um, you know, we've got always room for growth. We're a growth mindset. So I, I, as I said to the students, this is great. You, you, you tackled it first year and we're proud of you. And so we're looking forward to more competitions at, at, a, more, at a larger level, so. Awesome, thank you. And just a piece on that, because I know our superintendent won't say anything right here, but um, some of the funding of that came out of the superintendent's office um, through a 2020 vision um, fund when the teacher came with this idea, um, supported through Schools Foundation and through our superintendent. So I know I was there right there, and so Superintendent Kalaski, I know they appreciate that as well. Thank you. I don't have any questions. I just want to let you all know that um, this is so far my the fa my favorite part of, of being on the board, um, <laughs> learning. No, I mean in terms of learning and uh, learning from you, all what is happening in in all of our classrooms and then outside the classrooms. Um, the the time and commitment that you all spend, as well as your staff. Um, thank you for that and your dedication to our students. I'll just uh, add one more thing. I actually love all the innovation in here. The lunchtime library learning struck me too is really, really interesting and really cool. Uh, I know there have been other lunchtime uh, courses being done in the high school uh, that uh, by different teachers and they're very, very creative, very interesting. I, I want to go back <laughs> to high school, <laughs> so it's pretty neat. Food brings them to the table. <laughs> yeah, I see, that's right. They've been learning a lot about fake news and uh, some other topics that have been topics of interest. Um, <coughs> this is the first time, <coughs> pardon me, sitting up here going through this process. I wanna say I really appreciate it, um, both in Fundamentals 5 and 6, that there was a nice spread of uh, activities for students. So there was a mix of clubs, after school activities, some specific grade level things, and then some aspects that actually flow through the entire school. So I appreciate being able to see that full mix of how every student is impacted in all of these different themes within the fundamentals. So thank you for really showing all those different aspects. I appreciate it. Great, and I, I just have one question. I was wondering, is the draft project still do they, are, are they still done a little bit? The draft club um, is alive and well. Oh, awesome. Um, <laughs> at West Mercer second grade, okay. and I believe Lake Ridge second grade. Great, great, great. Well, thank you again for all of your work and for all of your colleagues' work on this. Vice uh, President Jordison, do you want to do a vote on now yeah. on five and then six, or do them together? Well, let's do them individually, unless anybody objects to that. Okay, so is there a motion from? I move that we find the uh, superintendent in compliance of fundamental five. Second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the motion passes 4 0. And then we move on to fundamental six, correct? Six. If you'll give us just a moment, we'll do a little switch here. Now that we're settled, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fundamental six, 
When we cultivate global awareness and understanding of real world problems, issues, concerns, commonalities, differences, and interdependence is really a, a hallmark of the district in terms of the fact that we do understand we live in a global world and that we need to be preparing our students for that, for that experience. Um, this is like Fundamental 5, this is the fifth um, full, prof uh, full governance processing um, uh, report for Fundamental uh, 6. So I just want to highlight a few things about um, in the quanti uh, quantitative area and then we'll let the school speak to things going on in their school buildings. Um, there is no EES data in Fundamental 6, um, so there's no dark line <laughs> and, and moving forward. But we've, we compile a, a number of pieces of uh, data around who's taking um, world languages and who's taking some coursework. Um, what I realize is missing from this is many of the students receive at the elementary level receive um, social studies and or um, integrated theme unit around global studies. We don't put it in here because everybody gets it, right? So it isn't a choice that a child's making. It's uh, something that we intentionally do in, in the coursework. Um, of note is that um, students really do take advantage of, of opportunities within the coursework, especially secondary. Um, we do, we did see a decrease for some reason. We don't know in seventh and eighth grade world languages. It's just something we'll watch. Um, you know, at this point in time, it's not a trend. One point doesn't make a trend, but it is something that we um, need to watch. And then the idea being is, is that the class of 2019 is the first class that has to have uh, two years of world language for graduation purposes. So it'll be interesting to see as a number of um, initiatives kind of coalesce. So there's that graduation requirement. There's the fact that we're bringing sixth grade um, uh, Spanish back into the, um, into the schedule uh, as an option for sixth graders. And, um, those two items as well as the elementary uh, Spanish program, it will be interesting to see over the next, you know, three to five years how that changes our, our, our look. It, um, you know, many kids didn't take world language at the high school level because they didn't have to. And now that it's more of a, of a you know, a general requirement, there are some students that will not take it, but most students will take it. It'll be interesting to see if they stick with it, you know, and, and take more. Um, of the foreign language. So those are just things that we're, um, we'll keep our eye on in, 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 as we move forward in this global world. So do you have questions about the data, the, the quantitative numbers? As we uh, look at the AP tests in foreign languages, uh -huh. um, it's been pretty consistent, about 12%, 13% have been taking the AP test. Do we have a breakdown around what languages that looks like? Is it predominantly Spanish that take it? Yes, it is. And actually, the breakdown would be in Fundamental 2, um, where it has, where we do that whole AP addendum, right, which right. would tell you um, where it is. But Spanish is, the, is the, the largest language. French comes next, and then Chinese is, is third. So again, that's another one that we hope uh, what we've done in the elementary schools will start to look like an increasing yeah. trend as well. Right. Uh, the other general question I think I've asked in previous years has been um, how do we track uh, conversational fluency in these languages? Do we intend to and um, is that a metric at some point we want to think about adding, especially as the elementary school students come out? So there are international standards about converse, conversational fluency through an organization, and I'm not going to remember their um, acronym, which is utilized in kids uh, for students that are trying to get competency through knowledge as opposed to competency through seat time and, and coursework. And um, it's extensive. <laughs> so we have never gone down the route that we're going to test every child at, at a, as a national or international standard for, or for fluency. Um, I would argue that when the students get to the AP level, right, to the fourth year level, um, they are uh, amazingly fluent in the language. Hmm. Um, Peggy could attest to that as, she, as an AP teacher um, of Spanish, but it's, um, of course, there are always students that aren't, but I would say the vast majority of them move forward and move forward with the ability to uh, test out of um, collegiate level courses. Oh, okay. I, that's yeah. actually a very good yeah. pairing metric for me to have in my yeah. mind. So yeah. thank you very much for sure. that. I think my question is pretty general. Um, how does um, 
how do you decide what languages to offer? Because I know there has been shifts over the years. And then also, second part of the question is, um, I know there's an opportunity through Running Start or Bellevue College to do things like um, ASL, but um, I know with, um, let me read your, uh, a lot of students who struggle with reading and, um, you know, and other uh, oral skills, right. um, you know, are look to that, and then um, transportation can be difficult in terms of getting to those classes. Um, so I'm just wondering um, if there's, I mean, the percentages of, of the languages chosen aren't broken down here, but um, if that is watched, and then when there's discussion about adding um, or changing languages. Right, so the the last major language change happened when I was teaching at the high school. Um, so a number of years ago, we used to offer Spanish, French, and German, um, and the decision was made thinking about a global society to bring in an Asian language. And there was a pretty extensive um, review that was done in relationship to should it be Japanese or Chinese or Korean. Um, and Chinese was, Mandarin Chinese was ultimately the decision that was made by that group. So they phased out German and brought in Mandarin Chinese, right? Um, and then about, help me out Mary Jo, probably seven or eight years ago when we added, um, first we added, well, yeah, go yeah. So we w only had Spanish at the uh, middle school for several years, and I think you're right, six or seven years ago, um, we brought in French. Well, when, sixth, when we moved out sixth grades, we used to have Spanish in sixth grade, um, and then that went away, and then we brought in French, and then we brought in Chinese. So mm -hmm. French has been there maybe six years, and Chinese maybe five years. Um, right. And we picked those at because they mirrored what happened at the high school, so right. yeah. growing that. Um, as far as adding a language, um, as you can imagine, a master schedule is pretty complicated, right? And I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, you need to make sure that you have somebody that can teach the language. There was a movement at one point in time to bring in Arabic, and there's literally no Arabic teachers. Um, to, 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 so we couldn't teach the language in that respect. I am aware of ASL, and I am aware that there are several kids that take ASL for running start. Some of the students that you are talking about actually will not take a world language, they'll go a personal pathway, um, which is an alternate route to graduation and um, would not even uh, need to have the world language in order to graduate. I, as far as I know that there's no um, movement right now to add a language. Fred can correct me if I'm wrong. No, yeah. Has that question been asked in terms of a survey, uh, whether to middle school or high school students, if this was offered, would you take it? No, the last survey we did was through the middle school about making sure that there was uh, suffi sufficient interest in French and Chinese. I, and the other survey would be the one that was conducted with parents when we were considering the elementary program. That's so we right. had a district-wide survey um, around there giving folks choices around what's, what language they thought um, Spanish was the overwhelming one at that time. But we could go back and look at some of that data or whatnot. It, out of curiosity, just clarification, was the question around adding ASL as a peer to the other languages? Is that what you were getting to? Yes, it's considered a world language. Yeah. I mean, I certainly would. Correct, it's, it's, it would count towards graduation and actually count towards college admission, yeah. So, I, I see, so that, that question, is ASL on the horizon at all, that we could add it as a peer and has that been considered? We have not considered that. For the small number of kids that question it, we send them off to Bellevue, or actually Seattle Central has got the interpreter program, so that's the place to go. But it's really considered, um, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a first class option. They have to go down the personal pathway to ask, to ask for it, is that, <coughs> that right? But we could make it a first class option. No, it's a first class option if they go running start. Um, then it becomes just part, they take world language just like everybody else. Um, the personal pathway would be if they didn't take a language at all, no matter who I or see. On, on our campus or, or um, uh, in running start. Okay, okay, thank you. Any other questions? I'll, th I'll throw one out, but Brian, do you, do you have a question? No? Okay. Um, I was curious how difficult it was to work back in sixth grade Spanish in this may be a two-part question. <laughs> so <laughs> how, how difficult it was to work 
that back in and what you had to kind of give up because you, it's always uh, kind of a give up, uh, possibly. And um, I forgot what the second part was. Just hang on just for a second here. Oh, and I guess the question is if you have a middle school student that is in music that continues to, you know, have one elective all the way, all the way through. Do they have, I'm not, I'm not familiar with the amount of electives they have. Do they have the ability to, to do Spanish and continue the work that they may have done through uh, K through five? Yes, that's the easiest of the two <laughs> questions. So thanks for that one. Yes, um, so our sixth graders have limited choice, um, but this year they do have two choices and a music choice or a fine arts choice is one of them. And then language or tech was the other choice. So what we, what we gave up in a sense was um, a forced tech rotation. So our kids go through health, PE, and then a third trimester has been tech. And actually both Spanish and tech are in flux at this point because this is a one year band-aid um, for what we need to build in order to really address the kids coming from the elementary school. So because the kids that will join us next year have had 40 minutes of Spanish once a week for two years, the as we're thinking about the program we don't see them as coming in and being able to jump into a like a Spanish one class but in a few years we do think they will be able to potentially so we're gonna need to shift how we do language at the middle school in the coming years and make sure that there are there's flexibility so a sixth grader could take Spanish one maybe they could take Spanish two. May, you know what happens if somebody moves into the school district and has no Spanish and wants to take it where do they enter in the system so it makes it challenging to think so right now we have shifted tech because that was a question that we were asking ourselves is is this forced tech class really meeting the needs of our kids? Are they already coming to us with the skills that we're teaching them now in sixth grade that used to make sense and now maybe don't as much? So we're, we're really gonna play with our tech class next year to think about what makes better sense for sixth graders um, while providing those who chose Spanish that kind of exploratory. So I'm not sure that's exactly answering your question, but that's where we are, okay. So unless there's any other questions about the qualitative, then we can go with we the, will I'm sorry, the quantitative, we can go with the qualitative. Yes, we will move on. So um, uh, Amy, why don't you start? Mine's the first one in the list, so I'll, <laughs> I'll go first. It's actually uh, the, all the conversation about language is a good segue into the um, item I was going to highlight, which is our elementary Spanish program. We are in our second year of implementation, um, and over the course of that time, our teachers have worked very collaboratively across the school buildings to grow and develop that curriculum, and then as kids have had exposure the first year, then what can they change and tweak to make it different as they move through the grades? Um, the bulk of their instructional time is spent in more of an immersive environment where the Spanish teacher is speaking in Spanish. Um, we frequently go into the classrooms and they might start off with a little English and then they turn on their Spanish brain mm -hmm. and then at the end of the class they turn off their Spanish brain again. So the kids spend a good deal of their time um, really doing some linguistic problem solving, trying to figure out what the teacher is teaching them and of course the teachers use all sorts of um, multimedia tools and various ways to um, help students access the language. Um, it really is a focus on developing that language alongside the global appreciation of the different cultures um, who are uh, Spanish-speaking cultures. And so they do a nice job of balancing both the development of language and the learning about the different global, um, different countries, different global cultures that are a part of that. Um, and through that, they're really developing in kids that welcoming and understanding approach to that which might be different from my own culture. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I've seen over the course of the almost two years now is, and my building we do, um, and I think we do it in a couple different buildings as well, in the morning announcements we first announce the day in English and then announce it in Spanish and our fifth graders are the, the ones doing the announcements. And 
two years ago, it started off with two fifth graders coming to my office saying, you do the Spanish. No, you do the Spanish. And now it's, I got it. I'm going to do the Spanish. And they're, they're much more eager to share um, what they have learned. And they're much more confident in trying things on and taking those risks um, as they learn this language. Okay, so thank you for the segue about <laughs> taking risks and jumping out of your, your uh, comfort zone. So I'm going to skip down a little bit and talk about the fifth grade Islandwood camp that all of our fifth graders are going to now and how it, it really um, captures a little bit of both themes under this fundamental about the global awareness, kind of our, our place in this world and our ripple effects on and the impact we can have in this world. And then just um, using that uh, creative creative thought, innovation to solve global problems and innovate, um, and, and then the interdependence of all of us. So um, this is the first year that all of the elementaries went to Islandwood, um, not at the same time, but we <laughs> did all get to go, even if it was middle of January, um, <laughs> but it was wonderful. Uh, <laughs> So um, I, I went and I got to stay for two nights. So I got to experience it firsthand over on Bainbridge Island. So um, the program over there really um, focuses on um, combining environmental science, green technology, innovation, engineering to solve, um, to and innovation to solve uh, environmental problems and solutions and um, each each uh, group is led by the University of Washington graduate students and they came from all different backgrounds they came from environmental science science some of them wanted want to be teachers someday um, even global studies was out there with us and each um, each leader develops their own program for the students so it's a very unique experience for each each group of kids. Um, they got to step outside of their comfort zones, get their hands dirty, feet wet, to really jump in hands-on trying to solve these problems. Um, and it really, again, focused on using the science and technology um, and studying the inter interdependence of, you know, you know, our actions really have ripple, effect, uh, ripple effects all over. You know, and, and I just think, again, stepping out of the comfort zone gives kids the experience that my world may not be the only world that's out there, and my actions in that world might have greater consequences. And, and I can also use the skills that I've learned to have a positive effect beyond just my local community, but also to my global community. So, yeah. Question? So I was just going to spotlight the artist in residence in our orchestra um, program. So Vicki White Miltoon, in um, working with her Team O parent group that supports um, orchestra, found this um, mariachi band that came in and performed and worked with our um, orchestra program. And I had the opportunity to sit in and experience it with them. And it was just so phenomenal to see these amazing players um, interacting with our kids, showing them their instruments. The kids got to touch and feel and ask questions and they were making connections between what the instruments were that they were playing um, with the instruments, um, the orchestra instruments. They were talking about how um, the, the European influence um, in South America and, uh, the, and Mexico, Central America, and, and really thinking about the um, influence of African culture on them as well and talking about the, the integration, just having the opportunity to listen to the, the talent and understand the history of where everything came from was a really phenomenal experience and I think really opened our kids' minds um, about how music has such a giant impact on culture and tradition um, beyond the United States. It was just a really fabulous opportunity for our kids and a PTSA MISF grant. So thank you to those wonderful supporters as well. <laughs> questions about the qualitative. So I kind of missed the boat on uh, 
on Fundamental 5, but it ties in a little bit here as well. Um, the question is, we, we look at critical thinking uh, with our students, and I was listening to a podcast recently where they were talking about critical thinking and um, how important it is, especially in our current climate. Um, and a piece that, that comes into that that these particular uh, PhDs were talking about was um, they wish that everyone in secondary education had to take a logic course mm. uh, as philosophy and how to utilize logic. And I was thinking about that as, as reviewing these fundamentals and thinking of the role that critical thinking and logic plays and wondering if there are ways that, um, wondering how those concepts are embedded already uh, in our schools and how we might grow that. Um, because I, I think, at least for me, that's a really pressing issue right now in our communities is that ability to use logic and critical thinking to make sense of the world around us. Um, and so I think that'd be really important for our kids. Um, but outside of that, um, I wanted to take a moment um, to thank you all so much uh, who presented on Fundamental 5 and Fundamental 6. These packets are huge. Um, and the work that you must put into it to, to present these on a regular basis for the board. I want to express my appreciation for that. Um, and for anyone who's watching or observing, I encourage them to go into the board packet and to actually read through all of the information, the pages and pages and pages that are put here for us to go through. Um, and so it is Teacher Appreciation Week, and so I'm showing my absolute appreciation to all of you for being here, taking the time to present this year after year to us, and really breaking up this data and letting us understand um, what's happening in the schools. So thank you so much. Um, first, I want to just thank you, um, the elementary school uh, principals, for making sure that Islandwood is available to all of our students. Um, I know last year was a little bit of a rough year in the transition, mm -hmm. and for a variety of reasons it wasn't happening, but, but I know that that was um, a huge um, concern and, and takes a lot of work and dedication. Um, I know the kids don't care about going in January or February. <laughs> the adults <laughs> might, um, but but the kids have, I, I'm yeah. sure, have as great an experience um, regardless of what time of year it is. Yeah. So a little concerned about that last year, but it turned out snow didn't matter. They had fun when it snowed. <laughs> <laughs> um, then Mike, so thank you for that. Um, my question is, and, and I'll start off a little bit from where I'm coming from. Um, Everyone up here knows, I think, kind of my feelings about um, the elementary Spanish program. And, and if we could do everything, it's phenomenal. There's nothing bad about it. Um, but we're limited in time, we're limited in resources, and you know, it all has an impact on what we choose to do. Um, now that we're two years into it, if have your feelings, I know that, that, I know that overall it was met with some trepidation. Um, have your feelings changed after two years of the program? Or how are you feeling about it? And, and if so, has, has that changed? Um, I mean, I guess ev everybody's probably coming at it from a different initial feeling. Um, I have worked in districts previously where they had also had uh, world language of one sort or another. Um, and so I, uh, my approach to it was, um, I think, fairly positive from, from the get-go. And I think that it's, it's played out nicely. Um, I feel like the teachers that are engaging in that work have been really intentional and really focused on making sure that it's a positive experience. Um, all the way through the grade levels. Um, so at least from my perspective, I think it's it's been a good addition to the program and I think that um, it's got some some really positives to give to our kids as they move through the grades. Shirley, you've been here for two years, right? So I think that, um, you know, when we talk about or when Heidi was talking about kind of that global awareness, I think that that really has been very powerful in terms of kids knowing where they are in the world and that there are other people that occupy this earth besides themselves. So I think that it's been exceptionally positive. And as Amy said at Northwood, having kids um, you know, be reticent in the beginning from speaking over the microphone into all the classrooms to really um, you know, first come, first served, I'm the one that's gonna be doing it, I think has been a huge evolution. And then two, uh, spreading out and looking at those cultures through the bulletin boards that are hanging in our hallways it, they're colorful, they're inviting, 
they're student generated after the teacher gets the country map up. And so just having that out there uh, so that the kids are aware that there are other places and being able to locate that on a map, I think it's just been, I think it's been exceptionally positive. And I, I would echo both of their sentiments. I've, I honestly, I don't know your f feelings about it. <laughs> um, you know, I picked up bits and pieces in my eight or so months here, but um, I, you know, I I agree with what um, well both of you said, and I also think, uh, you know, when I think about placing kids. Um, in the global context, you know, we often, as human beings, make assumptions about the pe other people across the table from us when we're working with other societies, politically or in, uh, you know, making business deals, that kind of thing. We make assumptions based on language, and it's very easy for students to um, kind of naturally make an assumption that somebody is less intelligent or less competent if they're speaking in broken English. Does that make sense to anybody else? So um, I think this gives them the opportunity to put themselves in somebody else's shoes that's coming from a different background, a different culture. You know, language is very representative of every part of how we move through society, right? And it put, you know, I think about that stepping outside your comfort zone and putting yourself in somebody else's shoes or the other person's shoes. And uh, it's hard to do that with elementary students really, really well. And I think this, um, our Spanish program gives them that opportunity. I also wanna say that I've been very impressed with our Spanish um, language teachers and the work that they're doing amongst themselves. They, uh, my Spanish teacher, Matt, has shared the progression of the standards. I don't know the, the group that you were yeah. speaking of as well, and they're really looking at where d where do we need to start so that we can grow these kid kids and hand them off to the middle school and then high school and then a global society that they're gonna have to move in. And they've been very intentional and strategic in building the program towards that end. So for those reasons, I, you know, right now I, I'm on board, I think it's a, I, but I know we're always struggling to find those instructional minutes and prioritize wh what's, what's most important now. So I, I, I respect the, the discourse about it as well. So. And I really appreciate the information. Um, I, I, I'm not in the classroom and it's just looking at the big picture from the outside. So thank you very much for your feedback. And I think we have an opportunity next year um, we go into our third year and we will have an opportunity to talk to the middle school about um, what skills those students are actually coming in with and is that, are we even hitting the right marks in terms of, of what we're setting out to accomplish? I know that having gone to Connecticut twice to see the elementary program that we uh, used as a model, we're certainly not doing their model because we've tried to make it our own, but we might be able to survey our students as well, especially our third, fourth, and fifth graders next year who will have had it since their primary years at least um, to, to get their perceptions of it. Um, how is it impacting them uh, as we go through? So we have an opportunity next year to really look at it. As you said, we can do anything, we can't do everything, and is this something that we should continue to spend um, those resources towards, or do we move in a different direction? But let's get some information, so. I know in the Spanish program for elementary kids, uh, our, our teachers have been working on the curriculum themselves uh, as a collaborative team. Have we been able to get external curriculum or third-party curriculum for it? We, um, when we purchased the initial um, curriculum, we made, um, we actually purchased what uh, Sponge had produced, which right. was the form, the program that continues to operate before and after school. And um, a piece of that was always, we knew we would never adopt exactly what they had because their model is so different, but we also had four teachers that first year um, though not new to Spanish, they were new to, the, to this particular program, so they needed a jumping off point. Um, I've seen the evolution now uh, to this year, and now for next year, they're essentially, the skeleton of it will still be there, but they've essentially written their own curriculum now, and they've been 
on some release time, thanks to our elementary schools, um, and then using uh, professional development. But they've been actually using release time to write the curriculum. We've also used Peggy Aguilar, who was here tonight, um, and um, uh, Mr. Ojeda as well to uh, work together to start thinking about that K-12 alignment. So a lot of the work mm -hmm. she's done this year is to join their PLC, to start looking at what does this mean from a K-12 perspective and where are we all um, headed here. So um, I know Osvaldo's been very committed to this, um, Peggy has as well as those teachers. Um, we will see where it all goes, but we will certainly continue to ask the question, as we do with a lot of our programs. We'll be getting back our audits uh, coming up on our high cap audit uh, in the next couple of weeks, as well as the um, the uh, special education audit from the PSESD. Um, those are continuous reviews that we put forward to try to see if what we're doing is really making a difference. Yeah, thank you very much. I think this is a hard journey we've started on, and uh, I think we've got a really passionate group of teachers working on it and students on it. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm glad you, we've got somebody who can bring back what's happened in Connecticut. Uh, I did Google that when we looked at this program. They've been doing it for about 50 years now. Yes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a pretty tremendous uh, opportunity that's happened there and uh, people in the stores speak Spanish. Uh, they've got uh, Spanish restaurants. Uh, kids are working in restaurants, you know, speaking in Spanish to the community members who come and talk to them. It's, it's really a very fascinating culture that they've kind of built around it. And you know, it'd be, it, it seems like something Mercer Island could, could get to uh, and be very progressive and a great opportunity for, for kids in the long run. So I, I, I hope we do carry the vision around this. I do hope that we give opportunity for some of the teachers to also experience what it would, what you know, these long-term outcomes do look like by doing professional development uh, with um, school districts that have done this before. So uh, more power on this one, I think. It's, it's, uh, it's very tough. <laughs> so I'd like to echo the, uh, my other board director's compliments to your staff and you for preparing this. Uh, it's a lot of work and it's really impressive in your dedication. and. Uh, it was also, I really appreciated hearing uh, about your um, experiences with the Spanish language program. Uh, to me, I think it's an exciting opportunity as someone who uh, struggled to learn a foreign language in high school. Uh, <laughs> learning it much younger, uh, it seems like there's a lot of benefits. So I am thrilled about this program and also appreciate, uh, well, I, I appreciate the challenge that these four teachers are going through creating this curriculum because every year it advances, they're having to differentiate it for one additional class, you know. So, and that's gonna continue for a number of years and that must be a lot of work and uh, also appreciate integrating it with the middle school and the high school. So, thank you again. And is there a motion to? Uh I move we find the superintendent in compliance with fundamental six. I second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes 4-0. Thank you very much. Sure. I do have a quick question, and this is related to the superintendent. Um, did I notice that there's new information within the interpretation of Fundamental 5? The only new information is regarding the fact that last May, the board um, added the word leadership mm -hmm. to the description in Fundamental 5. So um, that component was then added within the themes for Fundamental 5 as well. So there is a description of leadership added into the interpretation, but that's the only change at this time. Okay. Yeah, I, I had gone through and I, I highlighted, I, I looked at, uh, used last year's document, um, and review as a, an example. So I did notice that, that that new breakout section had been added in um, under, uh, I guess that's uh, for technology literacy students will. Um, and then there were, looked like just a couple extra paragraphs. I, ju I just wanted to point out that I appreciate that I, I see the interpretation expanding 
And um, yeah. Um. So, um, given the time, I'm thinking we're, and we have uh, public input right now, maybe we'll take public input right now, and then after public input, uh, we'll take a short uh, eight minute break, and I'll just read um, the public input rules of engagement somewhere. Let's see, bear with me. I believe it's in the agenda. Yeah. Under I'm just trying to find it. <laughs> if anybody's got it, feel free to throw it my way. Got it. Thank you. Yes. So this meeting is a meeting of the board in public. If you would like to address the board on a particular issue, please limit your remarks to m not more than three minutes. Um, and the board may direct the superintendent to respond to issues expressed at a later date. Thank you. And So this is a to the board. I just wanted to make sure that before I transition out from the Mercer Island School District that I just express my gratitude at the deep honor that it has been to be a part of the leadership team with the Mercer Island School District. And I, I can't tell you, I didn't know when I started the journey. This was my first step in my admin piece. I had no idea um, what it would be like or what it would feel like, and it has far exceeded all of my hopes and dreams. This has been the only place that I ever would have wanted to start my journey. The um, leadership team here, the entire staff, regardless of what role they serve, the community, the parents, and the students have been amazing. And I, and I really want to acknowledge truly more, more than anything is the leadership team because I think that when you hire well, you have strength. And I think that you have done an exceptionally fine job of hiring well at all levels, levels of your leadership team, not only in the public, when you see them here presenting all the things that they do for all the students that are in your community, but during those quiet spaces behind closed doors, they, I can tell you, because I'm, I'm, I get to listen, I have the honor and the privilege of listening to them, and they are always, always, always doing what's best by students. And I just think that it's important that you know that, that um, whether we're meeting as a leadership team, an instructional leadership team, whether I'm in my building, whether we're meeting as elementary principals, whether the middle school staff or the high school staff are there, you have hired incredibly well. You have people that are standing in front of your community, your students and your teaching staff, and they are have they have high expectations and they are doing it with grace and compassion so on my end i just want to say thank you for the opportunity it has been an incredible 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 honor so thank you thank you and thank you for those words and thank you for all the work you've done appreciate it so unless there's any objections we'll Go for a recess for about eight minutes and come back about 
All right. So we're uh, reconvening after a short um, recess, and now we're moving to um, uh, Section 4, Partial Governance Process Monitoring, Subject A, Board Policy 1800, OE 11, Facilities and Capital Assets, and a Project Update. Um, Superintendent. So we have Brandy here with always an exciting report for us, and this month is even more exciting because we get to talk about pipes. So she is going to tell us about um, the pool among other projects that are ongoing right now. Brandy. Great, thank you, Donna. Um, the pool is really our main focus tonight, so I'll, I'll cruise through the other things pretty quickly. Uh, we're still on target to reconfigure the office at Island Park to make that a better connection with the new security entry that we put in. Um, we are also looking at some options for the high school. Is there anything that you wanted to say on that, Donna? We're, as Brandy said, really just looking at options. We know that best practices are that single entry during instruction time, and um, the district's done great work for our elementaries, our middle school with the new building. Um, is pretty functional with that as well. Um, our issue, of course, has been the high school. We've locked doors. We only have the one door, but there's still concerns because it's not visible at all. So we're working on a solution for that that we have some initial plans. Great. Um, so the big one I wanted to talk about tonight is Mary Waite Pool. As you're probably all aware, our pipelining project was very successful. Um, we're getting a lot of mileage out of these photos because they actually look like what's on New Flow's website, but they're not. There are pipes. Um, things were in much worse condition, I think, actually, than we uh, expected they would be. Um, we were successful in lining all of the supply lines. We had a little issue in the drain lines and had to take a little bit different approach to that and ended up keeping the pool closed for longer than we anticipated. We had all kind of had that in the back of our minds that we didn't have a meet scheduled that week or anything and if we needed to stay closed, we could. So it worked out fine. Uh, we actually were able to accomplish some other projects uh, and then successfully complete the lining project. So it was huge. And, and the pictures um, that are shown there on the right, we also took advantage of the fact that we had to pull all those pipes apart in the mechanical room because we had to be able to connect to both ends. And so, you know, they were rusty, awful <coughs> pipes that we went ahead and replaced. So really we have a full new circulation system for the pool short of a new filter. Um, so very successful. And if you remember, we had talked before about how there's so much to be done in that building. And we didn't want to start into any of it until we knew we had a good, solid circulation system to the pool. So in the last couple months, uh, hoping that this would all go well, we have been talking with um, the State Department of Enterprise Services as well as uh, McKinstry about an ESCO, an ESCPAC ESC contract or an energy services performance contract with an ESCO energy services contractor um, and have had them out and have looked at the pool and looked at the systems. Uh, and the, you know, the real advantage to going this direction is that as you're aware, we can only spend up to $100,000 a year on a building or a project before we have to publicly bid it. And we can GCCM a project general contractor construction manager um, if it's over a million dollars, but that's a very expensive approach. And so the state provides for this um, SPAC contracting that lets you go in and do energy upgrades. And as it happens, that pool um, is all about consuming energy, right? Electricity and gas. And so all of the systems we need to replace um, electrical panels, air handling units, boilers, the roof, the building envelope, those are all things that are eligible for this, this contract. We can also do a certain amount of non-energy improvements as long as we're doing them along with other things. Um, maybe the best part about this is that there's a lot of grant money available. And so in order to try and stretch that limited budget that we have, we want to pursue this ESCO process um, and see if we can get, you know, potentially 500,000 or 750,000 in additional funding to put towards the improvements in the pool. So um, 
we are ready to start that piece. The first step in that is called an investment grade audit or an IGA, and that um, allows us to identify a scope of work, allows the contractor, McKinstry in this case, to um, do all of the energy calculations and prove what kind of savings there would be, which then allows us to apply for the grants. And so um, we're also able in this to stretch that work out over a couple of years, which is really key to this particular provider in the pool and our, our programs for the high school that happened there. So um, we feel like it's a really good um, approach that'll get us the biggest bang for our buck, for sure. So we'll start into that IGA and then come back to you with the findings of that and, and grant applications. A couple months. Any questions or concerns? A couple, couple questions and comments. Um, number one, thanks for the, all the uh, epoxy line coating work that was done and it sounds like it was successful so that was awesome and saved a lot of money down the road um, as well as thank you for I think two meetings ago we were uh, having a picture with a, a big check from PSC that I think you were probably very instrumental <laughs> about so thank you for doing yes, that um, let's see Excited that McKinstry's involved because it sounds like they've done a lot of the former other forward thrust King County pools, which ours is just one of them. So it yeah. sounds like they've got a lot of experience. Um, uh, these are just random thoughts. It, I don't know if you've had a chance to talk to the city. I know they've got some challenges with water supply lines. I don't know if that technology is applicable to municipal water supply lines. It, it actually is, they, yeah. and they've done a lot of that work. I can't tell you how many visitors we had come through. Okay. And before week's end, we had at least three pools in the area. Um, either their engineer or their project manager contacted us wanting to know what the costs were and what the process was. So I think you'll see Great. more of it. Great. Um, and I um, uh, really appreciate uh, you and your staff looking at the the energy grants and the, the grants for that that's that would be great um, one thing to maybe ping uh, king county or claudia balducci i think we were at the baseball opening where king county had donated five hundred thousand dollars for that baseball field uh, it might be just worth a call to see if they'd be willing to donate something to this given it used to be their pool in the in the first place mm -hmm. before they threw it to us when it was 40 years old so <laughs> I, you know, I, I think that's a great point there is the youth and family services grants um, that will come available again in a couple of years yeah. and if we stretch this out we might very well be eligible for additional funding and remember that the King County Youth and Family Services grant helped pay for the resurfacing of the pool we did a few years yeah. ago so right. Yeah, we're going to scrounge every grant we can find. For okay. Sure. <laughs> and then the last thought is, um, I know I've heard um, people kind of w wonder about the efficiency of what is it, solar water heating. It's a little bit more efficient than photovoltaics for heating pools. And given that southern exposure, it might. If you haven't already asked that question, it might be nice just to know if that's if that's a. Um, that pencils out or not or absolutely uh, both the, the solar water heating and the photovoltaics are going to be part of this exploration and right. and it puts us in different grant buckets too so there may be a strategy and in, in how we put that together and, and potentially you know creating a community solar project where we could match community dollars with grant yeah. dollars as well so awesome thank you, you bet. good okay uh, easy stuff. Uh, the high school roofing is under contract and scheduled for uh, the summer. It's going to be a very full project. Um, one question that had come up was whether we were going to tear off the roof that we had installed recently on the high school additions. And when we did that work, um, we have very small uh, shingle roofs on each of the additions, but then each of those tie back into the main building in anticipation of re-roofing. Um, we did a, um, a, I wouldn't say it's temporary, but it is, it is not a 30-year fix for how we tied those buildings back in. So that whole east elevation of the 400 hall will be torn off. And then, you know, Ralph was saying it was maybe 3%, maybe it's even a little bit less than that. Um, 
of roofing material that exists on those three additions that we're going to go ahead and pull off and replace with new so that we maintain a full warranty on the whole building. Um, and then we have, you know, many new gutters and downspouts and all new sheet metal going on. So it'll be a big project. Um, and then the stadium lights are scheduled for replacement. We're scheduled to start that on June 4th. Um, and if all goes as planned, we'll be complete in early July. So we kind of got ahead of the curve um, on that project. Um, that's it. Any other questions? Okay. Just, just one more, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you anticipate that roofing project to be impacted around the neighbors around the high school um, during the summer? And are you going to share that information? We are, we are, that's a great question. Thank you yeah. for asking. Um, we are going to share the information. We're not, we're not required by city code or anything yeah. to do that. We've definitely made the contractor aware of um, what the work hours are, which have changed a little bit. No work on Sundays unless it's an emergency. No work past 7 p.m., uh, which is a little bit different than it was before. We thought we would do a door hanger um, on all the neighbor's doors just to say, hey, here's what we're up to, here's our plan. Um, and call Brandy if you have a problem. <laughs> Here's her phone number. We did that at the high school. Yeah. You know, we did the addition too, and it, I'd, I'd rather yeah. that I get the call than yeah. the superintendent. So, or well, you. Thank you for doing that. You did yeah. a marvelous job communicating with all the construction projects uh, and just letting all the neighbors know. And, and yeah. I think it really paid off really well. Yeah. So thanks. Good. Thank and you. Thank you for the report. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. So. Are we moving on to? Yes, no action. Okay. So we're moving to subject B, board policy 1250, students on governing boards, first reading. So we've been talking about this. Um, what you have in front of you is the um, policy and the procedures as well, since these both fall under um, governance. The policy is taken from WASDA, as well as looking at some examples of other districts that are doing this. The procedure is a kind of a joint effort between myself and Vicki and Fred. Vicki and I spent um, two sessions with high school students. We went in the first time and talked about the idea and gave them some samples of procedures and policies and applications and other things and they had a lot of questions and we answered as many of them as we could. We couldn't answer some of them so we said we'd come back and give them some time to contemplate and we went back and they asked a few more um, and we were able to answer all of those. I will share with the board one of the questions that um, they were pretty curious about was they knew that meetings were in the evening and there was a concern that if the meeting ran late, would they be able to leave? And I assured them, I showed them that yes, that's in the procedure that the board may um, excuse the student rep once the student report is done. And I informed them that as superintendent, that was my job to uh, make sure that I have the board president know that it's, you know, it's time now to <laughs> excuse the student. So that was a, one of the concerns for them. Um, I think you can tell I'm really excited about this. I think student voice is absolutely essential. I think it helps us all remember why we're here and the work we're doing. I think Vicki's pretty excited about it as well. Um, we've been discussing how to work with the students, the opportunity for the students, and that how to even include these student reps as components of the superintendent student advisory as well, which is gonna include students from all the schools. So. Um, we are excited to move forward. This is the first reading, so if there's any questions or things that we need to adjust, we can do that, but I will let you know that we're gonna start um, advertising to students that they can apply for this and that um, once the second reading and approval comes from the board, then we'll be ready to go with um, finding out who, this, who the students are. Thank you very much. This is uh, this is very exciting. Uh, for, um, we, we I think it's going to be great to have students uh, on board uh, on the board uh, communicating with the board. <laughs> so, uh, couple few questions um, on the procedure side. There's uh, purpose number two. 
It says representatives will provide insight and support to the board's understanding of student issues and perspectives. Do we want to, uh, I guess, what is and what is not a student issue? Do you have any thoughts around that? It seems like almost everything we do could be a student issue. So is a, do we think about any limits or not? Certainly. Um, one of the pieces that you'll also see in the procedures is that there is a student re report expected. And so staff at the high school um, will be working with the student re representative in helping them prepare that report that they'll be giving. So it will certainly cover um, all the things like athletic and events and all the things that are going on in the high school. Um, Vicki is thinking even broader and looking at ways to um, have the student representatives communicate with the other schools as well to um, bring that into it. And then certainly an opportunity for the student to express a concern for perhaps an ongoing issue that the board might not necessarily be able to act on, but at least could receive that information. So we will be um, reviewing those reports with the students as, as before they come to the board as well. And uh, th that's, that sounds, sounds reasonable. I, um, on the selection of the, of the st students, um, I'm curious, you know, I think it, we later say rem removal, there was something about this, uh, this student serves at the uh, direction of the board, but on the selection, I'm curious, should the board president be involved in that at all or not? It currently, there is no board president involvement. Um, so I was wondering about that little discrepancy. The board can fire but not hire seems <laughs> seems a odd place to be. So in the removal piece, you know that that is there as um, kind of a, a safety catch, but certainly that you have it there, but something you hope you never have to use um, if there are concerns that either come from the board and or the superintendent as it's worded. Um, so that way if the board would come through the superintendent say have concerns for whatever reason. But the other thing we have to monitor is the same pieces that we monitor for students in other leadership roles is what's their grade standing, what's their, their um, following the code of conduct, all of that will have to be monitored as well, which will be, um, I'll be in conference with the, the principal for that piece. So be, that's why we have and or superintendent on the removal piece. Uh, I guess I, I, I'm okay with the removal. I don't mm -hmm. have a concern with that. It's just that the board is a part of the removal process if sure. we ever get to that point but the board was not a uh, part of evaluating the applicants process. So it's that the, the, that the board president wasn't part of that seems uh, oddity. Okay. And I, I'm wondering, was that a conscious decision? We could certainly add, I think it was more than anything, a um, timeliness of adding one more thing to try and coordinate a group of people to do um, the interview process, but it's certainly something that we could um, add by perhaps having a board president or other board designee, so it, it would, if they weren't a available, because the selection process you know, will occur during the school day because we're gonna involve students in that process as well. So we could certainly add board president or designee as um, determined by the board president for the board? Okay. I, I think that would be appropriate. Um, I think then that would allow the, the principal, the superintendent, and the president, and, and uh, you know, it is the board, so I think the board should be represented in that process. So I would, I would agree with that, but I, I would also look to other board members to get their input. I actually had the same question um, when I was reviewing it as well, and um, I, I think it's appropriate to have a board uh, designee um, if if the um, if you had made a different recommendation with regards to making it like an ASB position where there's only the students voted on it. I would certainly think it's not appropriate that adults be involved, but if there are 
administrators involved, um, and it's for the board. I also think it um, could possibly, you know, raise the game in terms of, you know, just it, it, it's a big deal. Um, thank you so much for bringing this to our district. I think this is going to serve our students well um, in terms of having a voice and also having an opportunity to learn um, what actually <laughs> happens um, outside the classroom doors. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, then the final piece was, uh, sorry, the last one, last one, responsibilities of the superintendent and the board of directors. Um, again, I think, uh, I wonder if that should be the board president who participates in that discussion with perhaps onboarding the student. Uh, I'm not sure if the entire, it's necessary for the entire board to participate on, on the onboarding portion and it becomes a president or designee, perhaps, uh, opportunity, as well as the meeting with the student and the representative. I, I'm not sure if you intended a uh, board member to attend or the whole board to attend or how we were doing that. It's a little, uh, it might be too expansive right now and uh, a president and designee, the same wording as in previous one might be more, pro more appropriate. That's, that shouldn't be an issue for the onboarding piece. So you're referencing um, On the number two, is that what you're Well, you know, the title of that whole subsection, the mm -hmm. super is responsibilities of the superintendent and board of directors. Mm -hmm. And then the superintendent and the board will um, act as an advisor, meet with the student representative, um, and assess the student representative and plan the future. So it's unclear if in those three activities it's the entire board participating in it or it should be just one member and it might be sufficient to have one member. So perhaps use the same language, board president and or designee, designee. so it's one member of the board. Yes, with yes, to team. help Got streamline it. all this. Thank you. I'm reading number one different. Um, in terms of establishing, I think I think the high school principal is the appropriate person to be the advisor for the student representative. Um, obviously, if they then have an issue they want to bring to the entire board, they can do so at a meeting. Um, but but that's that that's their day to day contact. Um, so I'm I'm reading this a bit differently. Uh, that one really is the principal that we're establishing the principal as the advisor. Mm -hmm. um, that. You know, we certainly would want to meet with them at the beginning of the school year, um, as they should get to know all of us. You know, outside of a less formal meeting setting, and um, then I also would, I certainly would want to participate in um, quarterly or whatever term appropriately um, feedback um, from that student that I think we would all benefit from. That's the way I read it. If that's meant in a different way. It was really meant for the establishment of the principal as the advisor on a certainly an ongoing basis also because as you can see we've got elective credit on there and so a certificated employee at the high school has to be listed on the transcript as the advisor. So by doing that, that allows for the transcript to um, meet with the student representative um, and the designated advisor which would be the principal at the beginning of the school year to review the, the responsibilities and how the um, board meeting works. I did envision that as um, the superintendent and the, and the high school principal meeting with the student at the high school, kind of working through here's how it's going to work, here's how your um, report should look, here, you know, working through with them, here's how a board agenda works, kind of talking them through. Um, gives me an opportunity to teach. I don't get to do that as much <laughs> as I <laughs> like, <laughs> along, with, along with Vicki. Um, and then again, also to meet um, with the student representative quarterly to assess the experience and plan for future activities, 
that again is, is along those same lines to plan for them, how's it going for them, what questions do they have. Um, but we could also use a similar process with the board as we work through this because we know this is going to evolve and change. This is our first year and even in, in the procedures, some of the things that we talked about were let's just do this at the first meeting of the month rather than every single meeting till we see how this works and what the load is for our student reps as well. So we know that um, even in writing these procedures that we would make adjustments probably within the, the first year as well to say this worked, this didn't, how do we how do we fix it? And so that would be some of the feedback to look for um, from the student. So so maybe then it's, um, I, I don't have a concern or a problem with any of that. Um, and then perhaps um, we should just take out board of directors in yeah. terms of the responsibilities. Maybe it's just the heading that it's the responsibilities of the superintendent. Um, I'd agree with that. I, that's that's kind of what I heard okay. you say too. I think would you like me to put um, responsibilities of the superintendent as the representative for the board of directors? And that way I can always ask the board for feedback on to make sure that the board is having the opportunity to give feedback on how it's working. Yeah, that, that, that's fair. Does that work? Yeah, so no involvement of the board on that, those three items sounds, sounds very reasonable. And we work through the superintendent uh, for this. I, I think that'd be great. Thanks for the input. Anything else on this? Uh, a few comments and questions. Um, but first of all, foremost, uh, thank you for doing this. I think we, um, uh, it was news to a couple of board members and myself about this during the WASDA conference. Uh, but we also noticed that you were in attendance <laughs> and you had experience of this and this is a passion of yours, so thank you for following through on this. Um, let's see. I was looking at another district's uh, policy and now I've got them all a little goofed up. Um, in their statement, um, in their three paragraphs, kind of like our three paragraphs, they have a statement, uh, student representatives will be bound by all applicable rules and regulations pertaining to the elected board members. And I was just wondering if, if you had seen that language and so if there was an active reason to keep that language out or is that is always in there? So you were looking at the policy, not the procedure, correct? I'm looking at the policy, correct. Right. And that's something you found in another school right. district's approach. So we've used the WASDA updated, yeah, and they haven't. Okay. And so we felt that um, in reviewing this with um, Aaron, our legal, um, that this was the the best language for policy. It was the best legal language, and um, covered everything we needed to cover as pertaining to a student. Okay. And uh, let's see. <coughs> I, I'm thinking of our kind of mutual shared and responsibilities document that the board mm -hmm. is, I forget, we're encouraged to follow or sworn to follow or something like that. Mutual respect and responsibility statement. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and it involves kind of the chain of command and kind of the chain that people within and outside the organization are supposed to go um, to with complaints and compliments. And I, I just have just a question, it's, it's not loaded at all, I'm just wondering if we now introduce this new student representative and there's another student, is that how is that student supposed to participate in that uh, statement? Are they supposed to go to the teacher, go to the principal, go to their student rep, Etc. Or mm -hmm. do they can they just ignore that student rep, obviously, and come to the board? It's just a new element, sure. and we don't need to answer that right now. But I just thought I'd throw that out there. So a little bit about some of the additions to the high school, and Vicky, you might need to have to come to the mic if I don't fit everything in. One, um, there's going to be some. Um, 
I don't want to call them changes because nobody likes that word, but I think some great additions to the, the leadership at the high school next year. Um, one of the things they actually have in their bylaws is a, a student senate. And so um, school administration has been working with the incoming leadership teacher to talk about the student senate and that the student representative for the board should be and will be a part mm -hmm. of the student, student senate. senate. And so therefore will have an opportunity through Bridges, correct, to hear the student senate and um, we'll be working, of course, with the administration and with myself to understand that they are here to represent the student senate. So if the senate is something that says this is a real priority for us, then that should be a part of their report to the board. So that will be a change that um, will, I think, impact the student voice within that area. So the, so the ideal is, um, I, one of the things I've, I've noticed and wanted to see come back, we had a student senate and it kind of floated away and we feel that the ASB needs to do a better, they need to be able to branch out more in terms of um, representing the, uh, the whole school and one way to have um, that happen is through a Bridges, each Bridges class has a, a senator who serves on the student senate Th and the the board representatives would be um, serving in a role as liaison to the board um, on the student senate so that when issues do come up, there's a bigger body of, of students looking at some of these issues that come up. And it is a way for them to vet ideas that they wanna bring forth to you, also vet ideas that they wanna bring forth to Donna and I. Awesome, awesome, thank you. That sounds like a great way to get the student voice and move that 38% uh, exactly. I was hearing that tonight. And that <laughs> we're we're going to be, it's going to look different. We're, we're trying yeah. to address that. Yeah. And then again, they will be a voice on the superintendent's um, student advisory that will be meeting minimum four times next year. That will include students from every school, including the elementary school. And so they'll be a part of that and hearing those conversations mm -hmm. and um, be, be able to share that with, with the board as well part of getting the, the credit, and that's a little bit of an incentive. But many of these students, the kind of students that are gonna come out, they've, they're already getting lots of credit. But, but however, we see the job being bigger than just the high school, and that they're going to work with elementary, and work with middle to find out what's going on there so that they can represent the school district K-12 on, on the board. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, two more questions. Yeah. Sorry about this. It's okay. Um, oh, uh, President Drinkwater sent us an email, uh, and it was wondering if it might be good to discuss um, whether or not children of board members should be eligible or ineligible to serve in this position. And when I saw that email, I thought that's a great question. That wasn't something um, that we had really thought of. In I will be very honest, this is my first experience of having a full board where the, each of you is also a parent of a student. So um, I completely admit that wasn't something I had thought of. It wasn't mm -hmm. something we had we had talked about. Mm -hmm. So um, what's the board's will on on that question? Do you think it creates a conflict? for, I don't, first of all, I can't imagine my daughter is gonna be interested, <laughs> <laughs> at least uh, the who she is today. Um, <laughs> six years is a long time from now, but, um, and that's assuming I'm still here, but, um, you know, it's not a voting member. I actually was thinking the same thing mm -hmm. as I was sitting here, and um, I, I think it's really important that our kids not be um, excluded from opportunities. Um, it, it's not a voting member. Um, I don't think it, well, it's certainly not a legal conflict as a result. Um, and the, they should have, our, our, our kids should have every opportunity every other child does. Um, you know, I assume, I mean, I know that there's been years where um, principals and, and higher level administrators have children in the district and, and I think it would be the same thing or same potential conflict, but which, which I don't think is a conflict. Um, and again, I think all students need to be treated um, equally. They don't get to choose us or what we do. So um, we certainly <laughs> shouldn't <laughs> exclude them from opportunities. But 
I don't think that will be an issue for me at least. I'd be concerned about putting staff for the selection committee in a difficult position around this and whether they might be biased towards, you know, choosing a board member's student just because and uh, I think that would be an un unfair perhaps position to have to explain to a board member why we didn't choose your kid <laughs> or uh, if, if such a question came out uh, in that way. So I'd be a little concerned on that side. Brian, do you, uh, do you, I don't want to force you to say anything. I just no. I I think uh, trying to think logically about it, <laughs> and with a critical eye. You can um, too. Yeah, no. I I, I think um, David makes a good point. Um, I, I I think there could be certainly instances of conflict, and I in, in keeping in mind my daughter, <laughs> who loves to lead. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I see both sides of that. I, I would hate for her to be penalized and not have the opportunity to participate if she wanted to. Um, but I could see it becoming a conflict um, with staff. So that that's very tricky. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought Director Lurie's uh, point was very well made, but I also uh, get your point, Dave. Um, I'm wondering if uh, the principal or superintendent would like to chime in, or you don't have to chime in either in, in terms of that, if you have any thoughts on this. Okay. I actually do have a, a thought on this. Um, first of all, I think we would all agree. Um, I, I agree with um, Board Member Lurie that I don't want any of your students to be left out of this great opportunity. I think it's a great opportunity, and I think they should have the same opportunity as any other student would. They are a student, from my eyes, they're a student first at the school. Yes, they happen to be your son or daughter, but it doesn't change the way we as professionals want to look at them as students, and we want them to be able to pave their own way. And so I, I would not want to leave them out. What I think we could look at, and this is something maybe Donna can help me with too, is um, we could look at the process that, you know, whenever we have a possible conflict of interest, usually the, the what our, what we do is we, we accuse ourselves from that. So obviously if you're on the nominating or you're on the committee um, for interviewing these students, you're gonna recuse yourself if, if it's your son or daughter. Um, and that would be very appropriate. It, to address um, um, board member D'Souza's comments, yes, I, I hear what you're saying about that. I also feel in looking at who in uh, number four in under the application process and who we've included on in that process is we're looking at um, we're looking at the superintendent we're looking at a board person we're looking at the principal um, the ASB person who is in a quasi I don't want to say administrative role but they're working very closely with administration and they understand some of the leadership roles that they have to in, in, in doing so. And if they felt that they couldn't, that they had the student in class a lot and they didn't feel that, that they should be, it, that it would be a conflict for them, we would, we would definitely, it says designee, which allows us to be able to open that up for somebody else for th so that they can recuse themselves from that so that the process is a fair process for every student that takes advantage of it. I think it's also good to note that, of course, this won't work the first year because we don't have any student reps, but we've written it so that in subsequent years, um, the senior, because we our intent is to have a junior and a senior, that the senior who is now in their second year serving becomes somewhat of a mentor for the junior as well, so they will be serving on that selection process team as well. Um, I. I agree with Vicki that um, your children are students first and they um, deserve to have the, the equitable education that all of our students, that we're striving for, for all of our students. Um, we all are very well educated in conflict of interest and um, also 
have enough trust to call each other out if we feel like there is a place where we would need to recuse ourselves as, as staff. Um, we, are, we work to have very much of a team approach, so it's not a one-person decision. And I think maybe, Vicki, that's what you were alluding to in, in this selection panel, that it isn't just one person making the decision, it's a panel decision, just like all of our um, selection processes include a panel, we use a process, we use a very fair process. Um, the only other one I would ask to weigh in is, I'm gonna put Erin on the spot a little bit. I know she's looked at the, the um, policy. Do you see any legal aspect that we sh are missing in the conversation regarding a board member's child sitting in this capacity? I would wanna look at it a little <laughs> more closely, I will highlight just um, as a staff member um, with children in the district, I would be concerned of the look of impropriety, which is an attorney something that I try to avoid. Um, so even if all of the people in the uh, panel and what have you were, are professionals and they are, there's always the look of impropriety and I'm of the personal belief, like if it were my child, I would encourage them to pursue other leadership opportunities um, just because I would not want to taint that because let's assume they were awarded the position through a valid process, there will always be speculation that my kid got that because of who that kid was um, because of my relationship as a board member and I'm not sure I would want that for my kid. So I just put that out there as a parent, not as the attorney to the board, um, but that's something that I think is worth noting because it's two ways. One is it's, it'll be uncomfortable potentially for staff um, because at the end of the day, we serve at your direction for the benefit of our students. We serve the community, but you oversee us. So there is that concern, but then there's always, a, I would be fearful there would be a cloud over that child's position as a representative to the board. Um, so I'll highlight that with respect to legality, I will look at it I, off the cuff. I don't see that there's necessarily a legal issue on that, but I, I do want want to highlight that because that's a perspective I don't think that has yet been raised. Yeah. Well, I think there's been a lot of thoughtful comments on this and it, it might make sense for us to discuss this next this on the second reading and we could also have Director Drinkwater here present too. Uh, unless I, I actually just want to point out a couple yeah. short things. Um, I, I think at least with the initial process, um, it, it's important to um, do it in somewhat of a blind um, way, of removing names and, and reading essays or answering the questions without knowing who the student is. Um, I think the you know principal obviously is gonna have, not a bias, but certainly knows all the students uh, as well as the ASB officer, whereas other members of the committee might not know the students as well, and um, that puts all of our students on, on more equal footing. Um, obviously, once you get to interviews, it's not blind anymore, but, but certainly for the initial selection. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, there's, we're, we're a very small community, and, and, and in, repeating, you know, student first and, and not excluding some children or students from opportunities. Um, you know, students, students come to leadership because of who they are, not because of who their parents are, um, and certainly through high school. Um, other staff, staff and administration might know the children <laughs> better bec or know who they are because of that, but, but students present themselves as leaders. And I'm thinking back to when I was in high school, several years ahead of me, um, our, one of our associate principal's children was an ASB officer um, because he was a student first. And um, obviously that's different because it's elected by the students, but you know, again, we have lots of students in this district who are children of administration and staff and teachers, um, and they deal with that every day. Um, and there was one last thing. Um, I also think it's important to note the only employee in the district that the board has any direct say over is our superintendent. And I don't think she's gonna have any children in the high school anytime soon. So, um, you, <laughs> you know, perhaps in the future that ne <laughs> might need to be looked at again, but for right now, I mean, 
you know, we're treated with the utmost respect by administration and staff and teachers, but we have pretty much zero say over um, their employment here. So any other comments or comment about the proposal about putting this off two weeks, as long as the, the goal here is not to delay this right. or your application right. process, and I don't think it will necessarily. But any comments on the topic or the delay suggestion? Oh, one other thought would be to think about uh, how does a conflict of interest get declared? Mm -hmm. um, I The staff, Certainly, you can declare within yourselves whatever procedure you want to do, but within the board itself, um, how do we determine if there's a conflict of interest that has occurred or not? And when a recuse, recusal is necessary, is it self-identification or is there some policy that allows a uh, majority of the board to make that decision? And I think if, uh, if we get to the point where a majority of the board can make the decision that a conflict is occurring or not, then I might feel better about uh, board members' kids uh, participating. Good point. I think we can, um, it was an interesting question, as I said at the beginning, it wasn't something that we had seen posed in any of the procedures that we had um, reviewed in preparing this, and as I said, it wasn't something that I've had the challenge of before. So we can certainly look at um, Director D'Souza's last point and see if we can weave that into the procedural side of it. Um, and again, it might need to evolve over time as we all work through this. So thank you for the input. You okay. just uh, one point on that, you might be able to look at 1010, Board Policy 1010, which you um, reviewed last time and put something there since that is your conflict of interest policy as a board. <laughs> okay, so we will uh, table this till the second reading, and we'll have uh, encourage uh, President Drinkwater to watch this discussion to inform the decision on this. Um, let's see, and I, I said I had two more things, so I have one more thing. Hopefully, it won't be as yeah. Who knows? Lengthy. Um, this suggestion by no means. Uh, presents any concerns about this. I love this idea. Um, and I think the, the policy and the procedures are great. Um, myself and I think a couple of other board dir directors saw the WASDA presentation by Riverview. Riverview. Uh, who, uh, who also saw that? David okay. Um, they made a WASDA presentation about the student voice and the student representative on the board. And they've also made a, a presentation to national um, what was School the Board Association. Yes. Um, and apparently 5% of uh, our nation's school boards have student representatives. And 25 school districts within Washington State do right now, which is about 8%. So Washington State's a little bit more progressive there. And there's three other s school boards considering adding a student rep. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's theory and there's practice. The theory is what we're working on here. And I have no concerns about this. I have really have no concerns about the practice, but uh, what I do want to do is make sure we don't have any uh, self-inflicted wounds in this process. We're dealing with the student, we're dealing with the public and the board, and I want this. I want us to hit the, um, the street running on this thing uh, and be very good at it. And I, was, I would be interested in um, maybe a workshop with Riverview, Riverview board members. <laughs> school board members <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and see if any other board members would also be uh, interested in a workshop with them. I think they'd be happy to share their experience and their best practices and I think it would give us um, additional information to really uh, do well by the board and by the student. And so I, I, I throw that out there and I, I know I mentioned it last time and I will let it uh, die on the vine if nobody else wants to do it, but I'm throwing that out there. Uh, uh, yeah, I found the, uh, the presentation very worthwhile and I really appreciate the level of depth uh, you're thinking about this and 
uh, empowering the students with all these different opportunities on the superintendent committee and with the different uh, schools as well to go and get an understanding of what's needed in K through 12 students. So I, I feel like you've got a great handle on having the, the representatives know well about who they're representing and what information to bring to the board. I don't feel as comfortable as a board member that I'm going to be able to take advantage of all, the, uh, all their intellect and insight and all this work they're doing. So uh, I would actually concur with Director Jorgensen that uh, uh, some sort of workshop with Riverview might help me as a board member be as educated about taking advantage of these, these kids uh, in the same way that you're presenting all these great opportunities to these kids. So I'd, uh, I'd second uh, that request. I'm always happy to learn and get others' experiences. I think it's the best way we can be, do the best job. I'm certainly in favor of it, and I want to make sure that as we go through this, that this is the best possible experience for the students involved, that they come away with this with a learning experience, and that we um, ourselves really hear that voice come through. I want to make sure that it's worth their time and that their time is respected. So I think by doing our homework uh, workshops and, and making sure that we're taking full advantage of it, um, I think it's best practice for us to be respectful for them. So moving forward, we'll anticipate a second reading at the next meeting in May for with an anticipated action on um, our policy and procedures. And um, in the interim, I will work with the Riverview um, superintendent and board president to perhaps come up with some dates for a workshop where our board can ask all kinds of questions about their board in a workshop setting um, and location to be determined, perhaps a field trip for our board <laughs> to Riverview versus a field trip um, there for him, um, them and potentially um, summer since it's yeah. a little bit less mm -hmm. hectic. I think August is August. a little bit kind of a slow time for us and we might be able to fit that in. All right, thank you for the direction. And do you have any concerns? Uh, I just wanted to make a couple comments. Okay. Um, uh, when, it, when Donna and I were having this discussion, um, I serve on uh, the Association of Washington School Principals. I'm the secondary rep for Washington State. So I go to the national level and, and I asked a lot of my colleagues at the national level as well as I was just in a meeting in Washington DC a few months ago. and. Um, there are actually nationally quite a few, uh, quite a few boards that are doing this, and it's a new practice that is becoming more popular. Uh, just recently, two weekends ago, I was at our Washington State um, representative meeting and got a chance to meet with about 50 principals that are in high schools all over the Washington State, and talked to several of them about their experience. Um, and not a one said a negative experience. They did talk about appropriate boundaries. And I think that's something that we would want to learn more about, um, you know, in terms of what's the board's role with students, especially if there's contentious issues that come up, and how does that work in terms of the board's role with the student? How does the student's role work with the board, um, and 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 safeguarding some of those, the the student not getting targeted and those kinds of things. And so I think that's what you were talking of a, a little bit, but um, it, everyone said. Um, very good experiences. Um, a good colleague of mine is in uh, Snoqualmie, and um, the principal, the associate principal that we just hired, uh, has firsthand experience with it because she's the one that works with um, students, and and so she sent me a lot of information about um, what what Mount Sai has been doing with Snoqualmie. I think the difference that that I've taken from the conversations is. I want our students to represent K-12, not just the high school. I think it's important for them um, it, to represent all of our students. And as Donna mentioned earlier, the way that they'll have that link is through the superintendent's um, student cabinet that she's, or student advisory that she's thinking about putting together that would allow for our um, board representatives to also serve on that, to be liaisons, to work with our younger students so that 
they come to the board meeting representing K-12, not just the high school. So that's the difference I've seen, at least with some of the other schools and th that it's usually just the high school and it, it just is a thought that I've had that I feel like in Mercer Island, since we are a tight-knit community and a lot of our kids have been together for since childhood and they know siblings and they know families really well and it's important I think that they they understand that their role is not just the high school they're going to be representing K-12. So that's all I have to say for comments. Thank you. Mary. Thank, you. Thank you very much. So do you need any direction at all? Or? I don't. I heard clearly. So we'll perhaps be s floating some dates for you in August as we get um, confirmation from Riverview if when their availability is. Great. So moving on to subject C, board policy 1410, executive or closed sessions, second reading. So this is, as it states, a second reading with um, anticipated action. You can see in red the additions that were added from the last meeting. We have referenced um, the board policy 1400 for um, the requirements for regular and special meetings so that it does reference back to that. And then a small addition um, in the at the beginning of this policy as well. Great. And under closed session, you can see that we've cited there that it may occur during a regular special meeting or at any other time to add some clarification to the exempt part of the policy. Well, thank you for making those changes. Any uh, comments or questions? What did we decide? Uh, uh, while our policy is not does not require advertisement of closed sessions, um, did we decide to do anything different there? We've been our our practice has <coughs> has been to advertise mm -hmm. advertise them. So what, 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 how, where did we land on that one? That's why it references um, board policy 1400, which talks about the notice requirements, which is what the posting refers to. And so it lists it in that board policy, so it does reference it back, and it does discuss, um, it does say may, because we didn't want to completely restrict the board um, in a situation where for some reason it wasn't able to be noticed. Um, so we kept it as the May within the law that um, is cited as well. I see, okay, that was, that was I guess uh, my confusion was that that was notice requirements for regular and special meetings are set forth in board policy 1400 that surround executive sessions. But then in section two in closed sessions, we should we have similar language as well? It's, it is noticed in 1400 as well because closed session or exempt sessions are um, may occur during a regular or special meeting or at any other time. So because it is deemed a regular or a special, it has the same notice requirements. I see, okay. Hmm. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so without any more comments or questions, we can just let this roll to the next meeting for the consent. This is that. actually your, yes, it's this is your second reading. We can um, take action at this meeting or roll it to the consent. Let's, with, why don't we let it roll to the consent and Tracy has an issue with it, she can bring it up then, and unless anybody disagrees with that approach. Okay. So now we're moving to subject D, 
Uh, board Policy 1800-OE9, Communication and Support to the Board, School Calendars for 2019 and 2000, 2019 through 2021. So here you have the next um, two years for calendar. These have been um, ratified by MIEA and um, are ready for the board's approval. As noted in the um, comment section here that um, both groups did a survey, survey of staff, survey of parents for um, feedback. We think that these calendars um, best represent the results of the survey. You never can meet what everyone absolutely wants, but we think we have a really good um, compromise here and um, will serve the district in the next couple of years. And as previously mentioned, we've also agreed to do a rolling calendar so that we will always have three in place so there won't be um, the angst, so to speak, of having to do three full years in a single session every year. We'll add on that subsequent year to, um, so people have the information um, well in advance. So it's, it sounded like there were quite a number of responses that went into the planning of that calendar. Um, I think it's important to note uh, parents were surveyed 1,300 responses were from parents, so that's great. I think it's also important to note that um, people may or may not like various years, but I think everybody can agree on it's really nice to be that many years out so people can plan ahead. And I think our school district is different than many other school districts that we can plan out for so long. So um, any comments or questions? I'm going to ask a question. Is it standard that we uh, approve it right now or let it go to the consent agenda on this one? Is there a time sensitive matter on this? And oh, yeah. We could again take action. Um, it's not time sensitive in that it's for 2019 20, so it is another year out. Um, of course, as soon as they are approved by the board, we post them. Um, I'm going to ask staff if anyone uh, had any questions asked to them of is the calendar been posted, people wanting to look at the 2019 2020 calendar? Yes, we have had um, parents and community members wanting to know when the calendar is being posted as well as staff. So we've actually had all of the above. So in waiting to put it on the consent, it just delays us being able to post it as the approved calendar. Um, until the next meeting. The how, how long has uh, the proposed calendar been available for the public to view if the, and if anybody had a question on it? I do not believe we have posted this as a draft on the, on the website. Sure. We have been working through the bargain process with MIEA, so that has just been confirmed and completed this week. This week. So we have not put anything up there. We, I, I suppose we could potentially no. put it up as a draft. No, no, no. I, no. I don't think that's, I'm, I, no, apolo it, it I apologize. Um, I kind of meant how long has it been on board docs? Um, for a week. For the week, for week since we posted the agenda. Yeah. Um, it's been as draft. What are people's thoughts about it, adopting it now and probably been flying a little bit low on the radar versus putting on the consent agenda and letting people you know, let us know if they like it or not like it. I will highlight, sorry, I'm going to interject here. I will highlight that this has been bargained with the union and approved by the union already. Agreed. Yeah, uh, I appreciate that uh, a great deal of work has gone into getting the calendar this far along. Um, I, I do think it would be respectful to get, uh, since this has not been up on board docs for very long, this is the first time it's being discussed in public and the first time it's, is this the first time it's available to everybody to see? So it, if, if, since it is the first time it's been available for everybody to see, um, I'd be happy to put this on the consent agenda and let this roll into the consent agenda. It, just in the off chance, I, uh, people want to give public input uh, around this. I don't see, I don't think there's any reason why we wouldn't go forward today. Um, it's been on board docs 
surveys were sent out, 1,700 people responded. Um, it has been bargained and approved by MIEA. Um, I think, of, I think put, putting it off for public input, frankly, is a little bit disingenuous because unless there's some extraordinary reason to change it at this point, I think the odds of, of going back through all of those processes are um, un very unlikely, if not not going to happen. Um, you know, in our in my review um, and in my knowledge of you know the community, the the biggest um, complaint I had was was that I've heard is um, with the midwinter break this year in terms of the split that's been fixed. Um, I know it was an experiment. I'm not opposed to it being tried, but but I there was a lot of problems with it. Um, and then I think that the other key issues for people are the start dates and end dates. Um, those seem very reasonable according to the calendar. And again, um, to be honest, unless there's some like unless there's something that everyone missed, which I think is unlikely, um, th I don't think there's any reason for any public input. We have public input um, at every meeting and um, did you know do not get a lot and also could have emailed um, any board member or all board members if they had um, anything to say. I think the benefit of going forward today outweighs the um, potential negatives. Any other comments? I, uh, I, respect, I respect that input, uh, Deborah, very much. I think, I think there's a lot to be said that there's been I can see that side, that there's been a lot of opportunity uh, uh, for input as well as the surveys. There is some value to having seen it visually like this. Um, I do think that when these things come out, that's when the flurry of input comes in. Uh, there is, uh, I, I agree with you that it's very, very low chance we would change these calendars but it would in, it, it would influence the next year's calendar much more highly. I think even when we did the split uh, sp midwinter break, when we did that calendar, we did get input negative about it. We did not change that calendar because we had already, to a certain extent, bargained it. Um, but it did give us input that has now influenced these two calendars in a very positive way. So getting that input has has been good. Um, how do is there is there another way to get that input uh, by um, still publicizing it in the n next board docs, or would we get the input? Do we get input when this is publicized on the web, and do we have a? Link contact us with uh, feedback, or how is that going to happen? Well, if it was posted on the next agenda on the consent, these documents would continue to be there as draft calendars because it clearly states not approved until approved by both entities. So th there, they would be up there again. They will be up there now as a document from this meeting and would remain up in board docs through um, till the next meeting on the consent agenda. As to posting on the website, we only have our confirmed calendars yeah. on the website. We haven't done anything to um, put blinky lights or anything up there to say this is up there. Um, I suppose we could, but again, it no. would have to be as a draft. No, I don't, I, don't, I don't think we get input on confirmed calendars. <laughs> we only get input on unconfirmed calendars mm -hmm. or, or thoughts around it, so. Um, is that, uh, I guess that I, I've spoken, Deborah's spoken, I'm, I'm happy to listen to other input. And I believe staff is suggesting we move forward today, is that correct? Uh, my only, I think so from the standpoint that it is something that's collectively bargained in good faith. And if we um, took surveys in and then we collectively bargained with them in good faith and then they ratified it, um, I think now to ask the public to weigh in and then to come back and add in whether or not they approve something that was collectively bargained gets into some dicey territory later on with just the overall contract and what's what's their responsibility there. So um, we did collect a lot of responses. We spent a lot of time at the table. Um, 
though certainly not as long as a normal contract. Um, we did spend time with them and, and thoughtfully considered, you know, parent interests, uh, uh, staff interests, and certainly student interests as well. So um, that would be my my point. And let me just uh, clarify. Um, I'm certainly not asking for input, given you know that this was bargained. That this was just suggested because it's kind of a. I think has been kind of a policy that we just don't uh, approve things on first readings. And that at that, you know, throwing it to the consent agenda in a way is we're, we're, we're assuming we're going to uh, approve it next time. And it's just, I think, s respectful to the public, recognizing that we asked for the input, we received the input, it was bargained, you know, very fairly, not asking for new input, but just allowing the opportunity for the system to vent if it needs to vent um, and yeah and I would it would take a extraordinary um, occurrence to make me think of um, ooh, are you going back yeah, I mean extraordinary but yeah I would second Fred's um, or Miss <laughs> Assistant Superintendent Rundle's position that this is something that we've Fred bargained. Fred is fine. Fred is fine, okay. <laughs> that we have bargained in good faith. So to yep. answer your question, and I, I understand your point as well. I just, to the extent you wanted staff perspective, I felt like yep. uh, Director D'Souza was asking what I w would recommend. I think that to keep it open um, does get us as uh, Fred said, into somewhat dicey waters because we have bargained good faith. It is ratified and I think and I may be wrong, but when we brought contracts and what have you before the board, um, they don't go for two readings, but I may be wrong. Um, and I'm happy to be wrong on that one, but I, that's, that's my memory of how it works or how we've done it in the past. I can give my input on um, the two reading piece. Um, not so historically here, but um, always two readings for policy changes, policy adoption, so you can have that reflection on it. But um, certainly have had um, many items, including negotiated item, bargained items, be brought to the board as an action item in that first meeting. Um, I think that the people who have are sitting at the table and will continue to be in those roles. Um, need that support of bargaining in good faith, and um, when we ratify, when they ratified something, we would never bring it to the board until um, it's been ratified by the bargaining unit. And um, because that was some discussion all week, have they done their ratification? Because if not, we're going to pull it from the agenda, and, and they did. And so, um, as I said, previous experience for me has been policy is always two readings. However, things like this can come to the board as action items in the initial meeting. That's a fair distinction. Thank you very much. That's, that's very helpful. Um, I'm gonna say I appreciate the, um, the call for transparency and for input from the public on this, um, but the fact that our subject matter experts have weighed in on this, have negotiated it, um, have produced this document. Um, we are going to get input from it, <laughs> rest assured. Um, and uh, <laughs> and if, if we discover things in there, then possibly we can adjust that ahead of the 2020-21. There's time to make that adjustment there and then into 21-22. Um, so I, I would feel comfortable moving forward with approving this. I think I'm there as well. Um, would anybody like to make a motion? Uh, I move that we approve the uh, calendar as uh, currently published and ratified by the uh, MIEA. I'll second that. Um, any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So the motion passes 4-0. Thank you very much for your work on getting this calendar. Much appreciated.
said, I was going to say, uh, if, if there are complaints, uh, I'll take some responsibility for that. <laughs> <laughs> Section 5, full government process line language review, subject A, course call fee 1800 OE10 instructional program. So we have Jennifer and, and Fred moving to the podium. You can see that this is um, a very in-depth report with a major focus um, on our college and career readiness. Um, the board has showed some interest in the work that's being done in here, being done in this area, and so that was the focus that we um, really did emphasize in this report. Jennifer? Sure, so in OE um, 10, you require a level two monitoring in item five and item seven. So in item five, as past practice has been, we usually take an area of where we have done some kind of in-depth um, curriculum review and give you lots of information, so to speak. Um, college and career readiness, because of some changes at the OSPI level, was required to um, do an extensive review of their program um, at at all the levels, so not only thinking globally about CTE, but thinking about each course and the updating of the framework, so we truly are 21st century um, with our coursework, as well as adding a leadership component. So if you think back to Fundamental 5, every course, every CTE course requires a leadership component. So um, some courses were already doing that. Um, you're familiar with International Entrepreneur and some of the leadership activities that those kids do, but in reality, all classes need a leadership component, and so what we had to do in a pretty short period of time was evaluate each one of our courses, uh, align them with the new frameworks, and then um, add that leadership component, get approval from OSPI, and then actually there's some other steps that, that went along with it. it it was a lot of work, but it was good work um, as we uh, brought our classes up to, st uh, up to standard. The other piece that many people don't understand is we have to have advisory boards for every single one of our career pathways. Um, and so um, David has actually served on, on those. And I think, Ralph, have you? Um, no, okay. Um, uh, but uh, we take uh, professionals from the field and, and bring them in to review what our students are actually studying. And so um, we um, made sure that all those boards were uh, fully functioning, which they are, they have been. Um, the community enjoys that, and we actually really appreciate that that connection. And it is expanded into the fact that we down do career talks. Your kids that are at the high school level, um, we bring in some of those people um, to help us with um, helping kids understand what being in the real world is like. <laughs> Questions? No, this is this is great. I also very much appreciated the background information too uh, around the naming and how many students, an incredible number of students, students. participate. Sure. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much for the comprehensive report. Out of uh, curiosity, from a budget perspective, mm -hmm. is this considered uh, part of basic education or is this part of <laughs> uh, the enhanced program? I'll let Ty take that one in the sense that it's part of both, I guess is the best way to put it. We get a small amount of enhanced funding with CTE courses, correct me if I'm wrong. That is correct. Yeah, and but uh, in reality, it's the general fund that, that, that supports these efforts. I, when you talk about the level of detail of the report, I do need to give a shout out to Jen McClellan because she is one that um, developed most of the report. Thank you very much. Sure. I just want to thank you for all your hard work. I know, I know, Jen uh, McClellan put a lot of work into this this year. Yeah. Um, I just want to point out one. Um, pro well, it's more important than a typo under number one, and reasonable interpretation. Um, oh. The board expects the superintendent, and it should be her administrative <laughs> team. I'm thrilled that we have this leadership, and. Um, <laughs> It should be accurate. It doesn't matter how many eyes you have proofread something. <laughs> Absolutely. You I still I know get it was an oversight, but and it's we an important one. And we totally admit to cut and paste. Yes. <laughs> it's the most responsible way to do things. It's the most efficient. <laughs> do you need action on this? Um, yeah. 
Uh, yeah. We will. Why don't I just run you through seven? Because you also require a level two report on um, section seven of OE10. Um, took a lot of what we've done from last year, put it through, and then added some things and, and subtracted others. We tried to give you a sense of um, the various ways we try to engage community and um, and our stakeholders across the district from the district perspective, then kind of those bigger picture programmatic structures, as well as then all the way down into the schools. We didn't take it all the way down to the classroom level, um, trying to keep it a, a little more manageable on that, but we know that our teachers um, and even our principals outside of their formal meetings are engaging families uh, each and every day. Um, so we gave you kind of some insights into some of the topics that have been covered this year um, in the Learning Services Advisory Committee, um, all the way through how, how have we been working with adoptions uh, through the programs and then certainly those school facilitated teams. You hear about some of these, I know throughout the year, throughout different uh, board reports and others, <laughs> um, but this is a, a place where we can kind of synthesize everything. So with that, I think what you have to decide as a board is whether or not you wanna go one by one um, as you go through this OE10 or approve it all together with the amendment, of course. Um, uh, so that's up to you, but we're happy to take questions on uh, five and seven. So seeing no questions or comments, is there a motion that would um, approve OE10 items one through 10 with the uh, my, uh, with the uh, modification. So, uh, one quick question, then I'll. Yeah. In the graduate surveys in the survey section, uh, did those get did those get brought to the board at all? We have not. I don't believe we have before, um, Director D'Souza. Um, I think they haven't necessarily been folded into any of the. Um, fundamental reports at this point, if that's a data point that you'd like uh, to take a look at, I, I, you know, you could certainly um, talk to superintendent about that and, and we could look at um, some of that of the initial data that we're getting back. Remember we went with the 2016 graduating class was the first one that we actually surveyed. Um, so this will be our third year of graduates, but we went back to the 2014 class and 15 class and started mailers trying to get as much information from them um, based on their experience. So if that's something that you'd want either in a board retreat or at a future time, we could certainly bring that information. That's great. So um, thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, I move that we find the superintendent uh, in compliance. Second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 4-0, thank you. And then uh, we have uh, Board Policy 1800 OE7 Financial Administration Language Review. This one is a language review. It does not, um, it's a discussion item for this evening. Ty is here to answer any questions. Um, I know he's had a really busy week, so. Uh, Ty, did you have any presentation or are you just ready for questions? I am ready for questions yeah. tonight. Any questions or comments? Okay, so it looks like uh, no questions or comments, so we'll let that pass. So moving on to Board Policy 1006, Board Committee Principles Language Review. Any comments or questions? No? Nope. Okay, D, Board Policy 1007, Committee Structure Language Review. Comments, questions? E, Board Policy 1009, Board Members Code of Conduct Language Review. F, Board Policy 1010, Board Member Conflict of Interest Language Review. 
And lastly, G, Board Policy 1011, Process for Addressing Board Member Violations Language Review. Okay. Moving on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion? I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes 4-0. Superintendent's report. Just a few brief pieces for you tonight. Just um, as you're all aware, um, this has been Teacher Appreciation Week. We still have one more day. And um, the, I know our teachers are feeling very loved and very appreciated by how much our PTAs have been feeding them. There is food on every campus. It's amazing. It's great. Um, the other thing we are um, doing a little different this year is years of service presentations at each site. Um, we've had two today, morning and afternoon, and um, it was great to see the milestones of 5, 10, 15, 20. I think we had some 25 this morning at West Mercer. And amazingly, um, I shared at the high school that we had a 40-year um, employee at the high school. That's only the second that I've recognized for 40 years of service in a district. Um, Jane at the high school in the cafeteria that those of you who went to the high school probably remember Jane. She's, she's awesome. Uh, just some quick reminders for the boards. Um, two meetings next week. Tuesday is our special meeting where we start at Northwood and then move into our workshop. And then on the 17th is our uh, special meeting for a linkage session with the city. And um, just a quick update. Fred mentioned it earlier in the reports. We are, we are anticipating our high cap audit report and our special ed audit report. Hopefully the, um, by the end of this month and then after staff has reviewed, we um, hope to be able to present to the board the um, analysis from those two audit reports as well, potentially at the, maybe at the board retreat as something to consider as we're doing some strate strategic planning. So it doesn't get too far out for when we get to take a look at those. Just a question, has the agenda topics for the joint session been determined yet? They have been discussed, but they have not been posted. Um, we will meet as a leadership team on Monday for those topics. Um, I know we've been doing some emailing back and forth and uh, discussing them electronically, but I anticipate that they will post on Monday for the Thursday special meeting. Thank you. Um, and I think we just move to board member announcements. Nothing new. <coughs> so uh, I recently attended the Island Park uh, Parent Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, they're wrapping up the year there. Lots of great stuff happening. Uh, their auction was uh, finishing up and uh, preparing for Carnival and those events. Um, I wanted to shout out to Teacher Appreciation Week. Uh, a huge shout out to everyone in our district, um, all of our educators, our staff members, our administrators, uh, for working so hard um, to really create amazing opportunities for the students in our schools and our families. Um, and I want to give a little extra shout out to all the room parents uh, out there who, who are also working really hard this week to uh, collectively herd that appreciation in the right direction. Um, <laughs> um, it was great to, to sit in on the Your Service presentations uh, this morning at West Mercer uh, and at the high school this afternoon. Um, and I did get to also um, sit in on a, some diversity training at West Mercer, um, and I think that same presentation was given at the high school later as part of their um, professional development around equity uh, and diversity. And I, it was refreshing to sit in on that, and, and I, I'm thankful to the West Mercer staff for uh, letting me be a fly on the wall uh, for that training. We had great discussions um, and very positive stuff. Um, and then just a, a follow-up on um, or an update on the uh, policy moving forward from the Issaquah School Board. Um, they uh, shared uh, appreciation uh, for us signing on and supporting them in that. Uh, they recognized the few uh, changes and suggestions that we had, um, and so that we expect that will continue to move forward. Um, I think that does it for me.
I was hoping to um, have a more eloquent thing to say, but I also want to, uh, but didn't um, have the time to do what I wanted to do this week. Um, but I did just want to express also gratitude to our teachers and staff. Um, we're a tight-knit community. We have very high expectations for our kids. Um, and hopefully our gratitude, um, may, while it might not always feel that way, um, rises to that same level. Um, we rely on our teachers um, to take care of our most treasured um, possessions every day. And um, I, for one, can send m my daughter off to school knowing that um, her teachers are going to keep her um, as safe as I would attempt to um, and care about them and care about their future. Um, we, I, I think we're pretty good at saying thank you, but but we really do mean it, and um, and so thank you for all of the work that you do and the impact you have on our kids' lives. Just like to echo uh, those appreciations for the teachers. I think uh, for me, last year having a graduating senior, and you look back at the accumulative teachers they've had over 13 years, it's pretty amazing, and uh, uh, it's a pretty amazing feeling uh, having a graduating senior, and as well as you know the feeling that all these kids have figuring out where they're going what they're doing next fall what what exciting schools they're going to and it's a large part due to uh their educator so no other no other comments motion to uh in the meeting i move we adjourn second all in favor aye, aye. aye.